Welcome to the SureDog Radio Network preview for UFC Fight Night Dern vs. Yan, also known as UFC Vegas 61. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com. With me, as always, is Keith Schillen, the executive producer of the SureDog Radio Network. Keith, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good, brother. How are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty well. We had a we had a week off from UFC cards, a, a rare week off now that they're running, you know, 43 cards a year. Uh, did you do anything interesting? Uh, but a girl softball game. Uh, <laughs> that's about as interesting as I got. How about you, man? Uh, I don't remember what I did last weekend. I don't know whether that's a, a good or a bad sign, but uh, I, I did kind of miss it. I missed the chance to talk with you weekly about these these cards. Uh, you know, we talk about them ahead of the event. We talk about them after the event. Uh, ahead of the event, we usually do right off the top of these previews, kind of take the overall temperature of the card. Sometimes we'll even give it a letter grade in advance based on expectations. Looking at this 13 fight card, I'll go first and say that even for a free card, this one looks pretty rough to me. This one's looking like about a C minus out the door. There are like we lost some good fights. You know, they they tried to push Sadiq Yusuf versus Giga Chikadze to this card. We ended up losing that fight entirely. And now it's Yusuf versus uh, the debuting Don Shanus, whom we'll get to when we get to him. It's got other fights that were kicked down the road from earlier cards that I don't know that we needed. Like was the world really screaming for Alir Latifi versus Alexi Olenek so bad that when they couldn't make it happen in April, they were like, well, come hell or high water, that fight is happening this year. There's just a lot of that, a lot of that leftovers night feel. I mean, do you feel any different on this one? Are there any diamonds in the rough on this card? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, this card sucks. Uh, <laughs> Keith, all, always blunt and to the point compared to me. I, I kind of dance around it, and, and Keith just gives you the, the, the straight truth. Like, we all have jobs where there's things you like about your job and there's things you hate. Like, I have these, I don't know about you, know, you, but I get these, like, mandatory security computer trainings where you have to watch these stupid videos and answer questions. And we get assigned them. We usually have, like, a month. We get, we get once a month. I just, as soon as it gets signed the first day, I just, I just get it over with. Like that's this card. Like, like, like nobody wants to to do this, but just like, just get it over with. Like, just throw everybody in. There's nothing exciting about this card. There's some couple matchups. Yeah, this would be a fun st striking battle and this and that. But there's nothing that really shakes up the, the rankings other than maybe the main event. Uh, there's no storylines. There's no, you know, rivalries. There's no like. There's nothing on this card. So just get it over with. <laughs> I, I like the, the comparison you made to like the mandatory things you have to do at work where if they give you a time window, you just get it done immediately. I just do it right away. Imagine next year, like 2023 begins and the UFC tells us, OK, Francisco Trinaldo is going to fight three times this year and we could just record the previews for all of his fights like on January 1st without even knowing who he's fighting and just get it all out of the yeah. way. <laughs> I, I don't think I've changed my notes on him ever. <laughs> Just, no, yeah, I haven't like, changed my notes on him since he was in tough Brazil. Like, yeah, he hasn't changed. He's, no. he's gotten older, but somehow hasn't gotten older. Yeah, he was 45 then. Like, I don't, I don't. yeah, <laughs> he's like 62 now. I, and yeah, he's been the same guy forever. And I'm already talking about what I think is like the co-main event. And we haven't even started this yeah. thing yet. Should we just dive right in? Yeah, let's get into this. Oh, I want to give my grade. I, I give it a D. OK, so uh, I'm even worse than you. Yeah. Speaking of the D, uh, first off is a strawweight matchup between Jessica Penne and Tabitha Ricci. Penne, the 39-year-old Californian, is 14-6 and six overall. She is 3-4 and four in the UFC. Uh, worth noting that she took four full years off between 2017 and 2021 and came back rather unexpectedly, at least if you ask me. <laughs> I like you say took years off. You mean he was, she was suspended? Okay, yes. It's like, uh, it's like a guy goes to jail for 30 years. I took 30 years off. <laughs> okay, she was in... She no, was in no, Harold, no, Harold. Uh, you went to jail for armed robbery, <laughs> for bank robbery. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel bad just, I just classifying it. I get my life together. I mean, I, I do feel a little bad just classifying it as just straight. I mean, yes, she she tested positive. Uh, she got a long USADA suspension, but it ended up being something where if she'd been 
had that same test in like 2020, the consequences would have been very different. There were weirdnesses about her case, but yeah, yeah she, she had a USADA enforced vacation for four years, came back and uh, frankly, experienced surprising success. She uh, beat Lupita Godinez and Carolina Kovalkiewicz right out of the gate. The uh, fun came to an end back in July where uh, Emily Ducote came back to the UFC and kind of put a stamp on Penne. That was at UFC on ABC, Ortega versus Rodriguez. She'll try to get back to winning ways against Ricci. The 27-year-old Brazilian who goes by Baby Shark is 7-1 and one overall. She's 2-1 and one since joining the UFC uh, out of a couple of Brazilian promotions and LFA. She lost her debut to Manon Fior. That was, I believe, it was short notice for her. And either way, it was out of her weight class against a, a monster of a fighter in Fior. Since then, she's looked great, uh, taking unanimous decisions over Maria Oliveira and Poliana Viana. The most recent of those, the Viana fight, was UFC Fight Night Holm versus Vieira back in May. Odds on this one do favor Ricci pretty heavily. She's minus 220, Penne plus 180. Uh, Keith, on a card that, I mean, we've got Randy Brown versus Francisco Trinaldo on this card. Uh, we've got Sadiq Yusuf versus Don Shanus. Even with those fights, on this card, I think this might be the fight where we see the starkest difference in speed and athleticism between the two competitors, uh, talking about Ricci and Penne. Tell me if you agree with that and, and tell me who you think wins this one. Well, I, I, I'm assuming you're, you're agreeing with the odds makers with a, with a statement like that. Uh, oh, l- let me throw in one note. Uh, this was originally supposed to be uh, Tabitha Ricci versus Cheyenne Vlismas. Uh, Vlismas had to withdraw Penne's in. It's not super short notice. Like she had actual training for this, but they made it like, you know, within the last month or so. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not as high on Richie as, as apparently the odds makers are and you are. Um, but she is fighting Jessica Penne. So uh, like I, I, if you, I don't check the odds. I, I purposely don't check the odds cause I don't want to be influenced by them. But I, I, I would have guessed that, Richie was the favorite. I would have guessed maybe like negative one forty. Like I didn't. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't think as as big of a favorite as this is. And I mean, Penne. She. I'll say this about her. She. She's. She's well rounded. Like she doesn't have like a glaring like. Wow, this is the weakness in her. I mean, her. It's probably her just her overall athleticism. I think is. But I mean, she's. She's a high output striker. That she. You know, she likes to press the action. She marches forward. Uh, she likes head movement. She's kind of easy to hit, which which is a, obviously an issue. Um, but she does she does a lot of things right. She keeps her strikes inside tight. She has got a long jab. Uh, she lacks power. She's she's more of an arm puncher, uh, more of a point, point fighter than than you know a big big header. Uh, but she she likes to throw some a lot of kicks because of her size. Like she's a, one of the taller ones for the, in the division. Um, uh, she does throw some naked leg kicks. It kind of leaves her open her chin open for her to get hit. Uh, but she has those long legs, and because of those long legs, that targets we saw that in her last fight, Emily Dakota like destroyed her with with leg kicks. But it, she can wrestle a little bit. She can get inside the clinch. She she can kind of grind in there. She can get some upper body takedowns. She will shoot for takedowns, though I wouldn't call her a strong wrestler. She's more of like a catch your leg and take you down that way. But she's a Brazilian just do black belt. Uh, she does have some submission, some submissions. She got eight submissions in her career, so uh, she. She's not an easy out. Um, Richie is small. She's small for women. She's like five foot one. She she looks like an animal. Uh, as far as so striking, she's a boxer. She can fight at both stances, uh, but she's a pocket boxer. She needs to get inside. Uh, she has a little Dan Henderson in there, where she kind of throws her overhand right a lot. A lot of her power shots. Uh, she also rolls with punches, which never looks good to the judges. But I agree that she's got some speed in there, uh, and and she's really good in the clinch because she's a judo black belt. She likes to grind in the clinch. She's got some good uh, good takedowns, some upper body takedowns. Uh, she, she showed in her last fight that she can shoot some entries. She does have two submissions. Win. And the, the most impressive thing about her grappling is that she she avoided submission attempts from Pollyanna Viana, which is which is a good accomplishment. Uh, yeah, I actually this is a much tougher fight than than the odds make us say, but I, I think Richie is the more technically sound fighter. She's given up four inches in height and five inches in reach, which, which will be tough to get around. Uh, and, and probably even more in inches and in, in, in leg, you know, I know they don't measure the legs, but if she can get beyond that reach, she's the better inside fighter. Uh, I'm leaning that way. I think she gets some takedowns, get some top control. So give me Richie by decision. 
Yeah, I'm I'm with you here. I I just Penny, you know, she she hung around for a while and, you know, even made it to a title shot as a kind of low power outfighter uh and, you know, got absolutely chewed up by the perfect relatively low power outfighter in uh Yoani on Jacek. But <clears throat> Since she's been back, I, I think she's shown surprising signs of life, considering how long she was gone and, as you pointed out, why she was gone. Um, but I think the Dakota fight kind of showed where the cap is on on this little feel-good return story. And for someone who turns 40 in, in January, you know, like, I, I can't imagine she's going to get faster or sharper between her last fight and this one. You pointed out Richie is small for the division. I think that's probably going to define her her ceiling at 115 because while you know she like is bouncy and quick, she's not a super physical powerhouse. I mean, she's pretty strong, but she's not Jessica Andrade in there. Uh, but I do think she's going to have enough to get inside on Penne. I don't think Penne's power is going to be enough to dissuade her. Like if she has to eat a jab and, and a right cross to, to get inside, I think she's going to be able to do that. And then whether she chooses to set up boxing inside or, you know, try to get some body locks and trips, you know, shove her into the fence and work for takedowns from there. Uh, I think she's going to kind of have her way with her. It won't be a sizzling fight, but give me Ricci by decision as well. Next up at UFC Vegas 61, we have a heavyweight matchup between Ilir Latifi and Alexi Olenek. Latifi, the 39-year-old Swede, is 15 and 8 with one no contest overall. He is 8 and 6 in the UFC. He is 1 and 1 at heavyweight. He fought most of his UFC career at light heavyweights, uh, one of the shortest light heavyweights in the division before deciding to become one of the shortest heavyweights in the division. Uh, since the move up, he has a unanimous decision loss to Derek Lewis back in 2020 and a split decision win over Tanner Bozer last June at UFC Fight Night Rosenstrike versus Sakai. Welcoming him back to the octagon will be a Olenek, the 45-year-old Ukrainian-born Russian citizen by way of Los Angeles, is 60, 16, and 1 overall, we think. We still find old fights for him. I'm not joking. I added a fight for him from like 1996 as recently as two years ago. Like we find old tournaments he fought at in Ukraine. He is at least 60, 16, and 1 overall. He is 9 and 7 in the UFC. Uh... He won his last time out, and it's worth noting that he fought at UFC 273 back in April. He was supposed to fight Latifi. Latifi had to pull out of that card, and Jared Vandera stepped in. Olenek uh, tapped him out in the first round with the good old women's flyweight special, the uh, scarf hold arm lock. Uh, that probably saved Olenek's job. He had been on a three-fight losing streak, uh, you know, could well have been fighting for his job against Latifi, uh, but, you know, by hook or by crook, he got it done, and the UFC decided that they absolutely must give the fans the matchup they've been screaming for. So we get Latifi versus Olenek here. Uh, Latifi is the moderate favorite. He's minus 180 right now. Olenek plus 145 on the comeback. I, I think it's tempting to underestimate Latifi just because he cut such a comical figure. I mean, even at... Even at light heavyweight, he is a generously stated 5'10". I've been in the same room with the guy, and I'm 5'9", and I'm not sure he's 5'10". <laughs> he's, he's looking up to you. He's looking up to you. But then, yeah, you know. him on the head. <laughs> well, but he's also 5 feet 9 inches wide. He's built like a circus strongman, you know, with his, like, bald head and his little facial hair. And, you know. His, his fight style looks kind of comical. All that stuff was just doubled when he moved up to heavyweight and he became the exact same dude, only 245 pounds with a little bit of a, a spare tire around him. But you look back, he's been in the UFC for a decade now. And who's he lost to? Gegard Mousasi, Jan Blahovich, Ryan Bader, Corey Anderson, Volkan Uzdemir, and Derek Lewis. Not only are they all top 10 fighters, they're almost all top five fighters. Like, like, who's the worst guy on the list? <laughs> the worst guy on the list? Ustamir, I mean. Or, or Blo Blahovich back in 2014, like, was okay. still not the, the guy yet, sure. but he was good. Yeah. Yeah, like, Uzdemir might be the worst of them. Like, and then, I mean, 
none of his wins are off the charts good, but people like Oban St. Pru, Tyson Pedro, Sean O'Connell, they're people who could who, who can jump up and tag a top 15 fighter anytime. You know, uh, yeah, PFL champion Sean O'Connell. It's PFL champion Sean O'Connell. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I don't feel great about him, you know, at heavyweight. Like, I understand why he probably had to do it. I'm sure it was getting harder and harder for him to make the limit. But, yeah, he's a little bit faster. But he's not that much faster because he immediately just went from 205 to 245. And, you know, he's pushing 40. He, he turned 39 this summer. Like, I don't have a whole lot of faith in his upside at, at heavyweight. But that's okay because he's taking on Olenek. And I'm glad that... You know, Olenek got his one last hurrah and got one more improbable submission against a much younger, you know, more athletic guy in Jared Vandera. But the stuff that made Olenek's run fun in like 2017, 2018, 2019, it's all gone. You know, when he got to when he got to the UFC finally, you know, in like 2017, 2018, the amazing thing was that I mean, he was already 40, but it was it was impressive just how how much tread he had left on the tires for a guy his age with that many fights because he had been like he'd made his way just by having a, a style that didn't leave his chin on the gunnery range like he'd he'd fought like 60 times without really being cleanly knocked out with without just taking you know Velasquez versus Dos Santos type you know three or five round beatings and so he was still able to take a punch he's always been a smallish heavyweight and he doesn't seem super quick but just he was surprisingly elusive on the feet he'd found a striking style that was effective for him and he had the heavyweight Damian Maya thing where he didn't have much in the way of traditional wrestling takedowns but just had sneaky ways of getting the fight to the canvas or just locking up submissions standing. I mean, he very famously got a standing Ezekiel choke on Junior Albini. He didn't even need to take the thing uh, down to the to the mat. But that's all that's all gone away. Junior Albini, Chris Barnett's next opponent. <laughs> Sign him, Dana. <laughs> uh, you know, it was the Harrison Overeem fights in 2019 that I think kind of broke Olenek. You know, he just he wasn't quick enough to get out of the way anymore. And he couldn't take the power of these big ass heavyweights anymore. You know, he, he still snuck in a couple good wins after that. But, you know, then again, he ran into Lewis, Dawkins, and Spivak and just the, the same thing again. There are still guys at the UFC level he can beat. Like, obviously, he just beat Jared Vandera in his last fight. I mean, say what you will about that, but Jared Vandera is a UFC heavyweight. Latifi is about as friendly a matchup as they can give Olenek at this point and vice versa. Like, it's merciful that one of them is going to come out of this with a win. But unless Olenek pulls off a really sassy submission in the first three minutes of this fight, it's going to be horrible to watch because all of Latifi's fights are horrible. Like, he's incredibly durable. Like, like Derek Lewis, like, punched this man in the face for three straight rounds and couldn't, couldn't put him down. Like, yeah. he is unbelievably durable. And he himself these days fights at such a slow pace that, like... I, I don't I don't have any faith that he'll knock out Olenek like he's he's not Lewis or Dawkins. I think we're like it's either Olenek by a first round submission and again it's going to be like an Ezekiel choke or a, you know a scarf hold arm lock or like a standing arm triangle or just something weird or Latifi's just gonna just grind out a slow paced kickboxing match and clinch fest for three rounds I don't think Olenek has one more magic spell left in him so give me the latter give me Latifi by decision in a fight that will just make us all want to die yeah um really weird if, if this you know we don't have the exact order we're, we're taping a little earlier if this is the actual placement as they have it on the website and this is the second fight out the gate that, that would really surprise me because they always like to sprinkle that that heavyweight matchup on top I can't and this is the I only just, one on the card yeah i can't believe i just said sprinkle i'm like hanging out with the, <laughs> hanging out with yanni, <laughs> yanni the greek um uh yeah, Olenek, I mean, it, what do you say about this guy? Like, uh, on the feet, he's he's very unorthodox, but he has this, like, somewhat effective striking because he's just so freaking tough. Uh, he's a heavyweight, so he's got, like, old man strength, as we've said in the past. 
but he has this like he leans all the way to one side which is really weird uh, he, if he closes the distance he, he can like dirty box you just as we said before like big brother you he just grabs back ahead and just smashes him but as you mentioned the years and years and you said he's got 60 wins you know how many losses how many we don't know about how many punches he's taken in training just you know uh, we've talked about it being 45 years old like is, uh, is you know 44 45 years old is that is that true i mean how think about how hard it is to look up olytic i mean we talk about him having sec- 60 wins he has i think he has 60 different spellings of his name yep <laughs> it's and th- crazy and that's one that's due to him being so old because the standards for transliteration have changed back and forth and because he has claimed Ukraine and Russia over yeah. the years and they do it differently as well. So, yeah, there's like four different spellings of his last yeah. name. It's, it's bananas. Yeah, he has a Times New Roman. He has a Times Old Roman. He's got it all. Like, <laughs> like, you know, he was before the King James Bible, like whatever. Um, so he so he's taken some some bad knockouts and you mentioned uh Walt Harris knocked him dead Derek Lewis knocked him dead you know so th- that's obviously troublesome but if he can close the distance he's a he's a good wrestler uh, I mean, he took down Derek Lewis like that is is a good accomplishment uh he reversed Derek Lewis in that fight and as you mentioned he's one of the greatest submission like when we think about we think about all-time great grapplers Olenek isn't one of the guys you think of but when you think of just a submission threat, the guy's like 50 subs in his record. He, he's yep. – the, the Ezekiel choke, we always talk about the uh, the Von Flew choke name being changed. Like this this should be called the Olenek choke. It really should because it's a different choke. Like it's not supposed to work. Like it, it uses the sleeve of your gi and he does it without a gi on. Yeah. It really should just be called the Olenek choke. Yeah. And then you mentioned he goes for the old headlock or scarf choke, you want to call yeah. it. Uh, and I mean, he's he's hard to submit. I go back to the Fabrizio Verdun fight, like arguably the greatest heavyweight grappler, and he, he wasn't submitted in that fight. Nope. Uh, Latifi, he's as you mentioned, he's extremely undersized, uh, but he, he he moves well. I'll give him that. He's 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 fairly quick in the division. Uh, the power hasn't been there at heavyweight. For being as you mentioned, if we're being honest, the power wasn't there at light heavyweight. Uh, he's he's a good wrestler, but he's not a great wrestler. Like, uh, he's not Corey Anderson out there. Uh, he, he'll, he'll get, or, or I should say, Curtis Blades. Now that he's a heavyweight, he, he's got a, he's got a lot of takedowns. Sometimes he'll just catch a kick. But cardio has been an issue. We've seen him gas out. I like his cardio a little bit more at heavyweight. Um, we saw him go hard against Derek Lewis, um, hard against Tanner Bowser. Uh, but like, there's so many. There's just as many negatives as Latifi as there is against Olenek at this point. But if if Olenek was ten years younger, or in any time, like three years younger, I'd probably take Olenek. I really would. You, you give me Olenek before whenever you fought Walt Harris. Yeah, I would take him. But I, I really think his body failed him. Latifi, I, I agree. I don't think he can knock him out on the feet. But if Latifi finds himself on top, I think he can land some hard ground and pound on Olenek, whose cardio is trying to fail him too. We saw that in this BUAC fight; he was really slowing down. Uh, I say Latifi kind of pins up against the cage and and lands some hard ground and pound. Give me Latifi. I'll see. I see it in the very first round. God, this car fucking blows. <laughs> that that's definitely going to go in our intro montage. God, this car. <laughs> Next up at UFC Fight Night 211, we have the the PFL title fight that never was, as it is Felipe Linz and Maxime Grishin. Uh, Linz, the 37-year-old Brazilian, is 15 and five overall. He is one and two in the UFC since joining as a former champion in PFL and a former uh, fighter in Bellator. He's one and two in the UFC. He's one and zero at light heavyweight. Uh, he fought at heavyweight his first two fights. Uh, looked frankly kind of miserable in losses to Andre Arlovsky and Tanner Bozer. Dropped to 205 and came back with a unanimous decision win over Marcin Procneo back in April at UFC Fight Night, Lemos versus Andrade. Uh, he will take on fellow PFL vet Grishin. The 38-year-old Russian is 32, 9, and 2 overall. He is 2-2 two two since joining the UFC out of PFL. Uh, 
Worth noting that he is two and two in the UFC. He is one and one at light heavyweight. Like Linz, uh, he has tried his luck at light heavyweight as well as heavyweight. And thanks to William Knight, light heavyweight plus. Uh, he uh, he beat Knight his last time out. That was UFC 271. Uh, back here in Houston, where he signed up for a light heavyweight fight and Knight infamously missed the uh, light heavyweight limit by like 12 pounds or something. I think they fought at like 218. Anyway, uh, he ended up beating Knight, so he'll look to make it two in a row here. He's actually favored to do so. He's minus 170. Linz is plus 145. I think it's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of parallels here. One, you know, both these guys are former PFL fighters. Grishin if things had broken just a little differently, would have a PFL title on his shelf. Linz does have a PFL title on his shelf. Uh, both these guys are kind of tweeners that have fought at heavyweight and light heavyweight. It's the differences that kind of interest me. I was shocked when I kind of started putting together my notes for this fight that Linz is 37 and Grishin is 38, because I thought Linz was younger and I thought Grishin was yeah. older. Okay. Linz just still has that young prospect feel to me, which is ridiculous because he's pushing 40. Uh, But they're both tweeners, but I like Linz better as a heavyweight and I like Grisham better as a light heavyweight. Linz at heavyweight in PFL. I mean, you can say what you want about PFL's heavyweight division, but he splattered Jared Rocheholt and Josh Copeland and they aren't that bad. Like those guys in 2018 were both better than a lot of heavyweights in the UFC right now. Maybe Rochelle. I'm not sure about Josh Copeland. Maybe Rochelle. Rochelle had Rochelle always had an avenue to victory. I'll give him that. It, the worst avenue to victory ever. Like yeah, like the most wrestle death. <laughs> yeah, and I like wrestling too. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm, like I'm saying, th- those are those were at least two UFC quality heavyweights. You can't tell me like Copeland is worse than kind of like the Chase Sherman, Jared Vandera level. Like, he's, he's at least in yeah, that bottom enough. rung. And Rocholt was middle rung. I mean, Rocholt was yeah. in the Sherman rankings the discussion. Yeah, he was a favorite yeah. with them. Yeah, and, and Linz knocked them both out bad. And the reason was, he still doesn't throw enough volume, but he had surprising hand speed and power for a smallish heavyweight. And I, that's, for that reason, I liked him as a heavyweight. And then he just looks super flat against Arlovsky and Bozer both. Uh, whereas Grishin, Grishin was always kind of slow and plodding to me for a light heavyweight or a heavyweight. But I liked him better at light heavyweight where I thought his big, longer frame and his strength and his kind of decent wrestling served him well. It matters less now because I, I don't see too much upside left in either guy. Like, Linz, just for whatever reason, is not the same speedy guy that he was in in 2018 part of it might just be that he's four years older and he is 37 now whatever else the reasons might be whatever toll he might have taken on his body trying to go back and forth i i don't know but uh against Christian here i i'm frankly a little concerned for both these guys making uh the light heavyweight mark like i i don't have a ton of faith in Christian to do it either uh but I think I think Linz might have more left in the tank right now th- than Grishin does. Just Grishin looked fine against Knight, but Knight looked on top of missing weight. Knight looked absolutely horrible at UFC 271. Like he stepped up on short notice. He he blew weight badly. He was super grouchy and salty all week. That was down here in Houston, and like just nobody wanted to be in in the same room with the guy. Uh, you know, I, I had heard that that he had the tendency to be moody sometimes. Uh, I, I seen it in person, uh, <laughs> yeah. off camera, off camera to a, a fellow New England. Uh, journalist uh, i won't give out any i won't give any names who he uh wanted to murder once but uh, it wasn't me and okay. it wasn't it wasn't mike heck was it nolan <laughs> kill the king all right um <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! The knight going after the king. <laughs> it's like a chessboard. Like, like I'm just saying. Like, if if you want to kill like the nicest guy in New England, like MMA <laughs> media, the problem's with you, motherfucker. <laughs> like, you expect people to want to kill Keith? Yeah, like I'm the asshole, <laughs> not Nolan. <laughs> anyway, anyway, like Grishin's win overnight didn't leave me feeling especially better about him. Just Knight looked absolutely horrible, and Grishin looked good enough to win three rounds. 
like I know he's the underdog here, but I'm kind of leaning Linz. Like I don't think either of these guys has much left in the tank. I don't think either of them has top ten upside at light heavyweight or at heavyweight. But if Linz is willing to not let Grishin just uh, like go on endless quests for takedowns or just turn this into a clinch fest against the cage, if he's willing to throw a little bit of volume, I do think he can land enough to win two rounds out of three and and, and probably keep this thing upright. And I'm going to call him to do so. So give me Felipe Linz by decision in the, in the moderate upset here. Yeah, I just... <laughs> If Felipe Linz loses, does he go back to the PFL as like the returning champion coming back? Like, like when BJ Penn returned to the UFC after like beat Matt Hughes and, and coming back, or, or uh, you know, Cejudo right now is coming back. The excitement. Do they? Did the PFL do that with Felipe uh, Linz? No. No, they do it like the pen thing, but they didn't really talk specifically about what he was doing during that time. Yeah, returning. You know? Yeah, the champ, like is, the champ is back. You know what? If you if you're gonna do it. This is the closet WWE fan in me. Like, <laughs> like you know, the next whoever wins the title, he, the, the, <laughs> everything goes black, and then Felipe Lenz comes walking out. Oh His music god. starts playing. Yeah. Oh my god! Oh my god! Back. That's Felipe Lenz music. No way! No oh way! Oh god! <laughs> Felipe Lenz. I can't believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, yeah, this fight sucks. Um, it, it is kind of <laughs> ironic that this card, uh, this is you know one of the fights that are low on the card, and it would headline uh, uh, a PFL. So, um, yeah, uh, Felipe Lenz is. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my notes on this guy. I, 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 um, he's he's not a good athlete. I, I agree with that. He was a he was the best athlete in the PFL. But, um, you know, you had, like, lumbering Jared Rochelle to, and Josh Copeland and, and, and Alex I mean, he Nicholson. Did, he, he knocked out Alex Nicholson. I mean, that, that kind of yeah. makes him one of our guys good forever. Guy. That makes yeah. Him, yeah, that makes him a good yeah. guy. So, but he's still, like, he's lumbering. I, he, he doesn't have much output. And, like, that's a thing that, like, just scares me. And he kind of... Since coming to the UFC, he's really fought like terrible IQs, fought down. He he got Andre Alowski like you wouldn't believe, or you don't do anything, throw single strikes. I think his hand speed has decreased. He looks kind of old suddenly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he throws a lot of looping shots. He keeps his chin high in the air. He doesn't check leg kicks. I mean, Tana Bozier beat him with just leg kicks, kick, just kicking his leg. Uh, but what I do like, though, in his last fight, he showed he has that ground game. He is a person just a black belt. That's what he originally like, was was you know coming into the PFL. What he was supposed to be that that was a big thing. Oh wow, this jujitsu guy is knocking people out. Like where did this come from? He should, he got four takedowns in this last fight, which uh, seems to me like he's showing that he needs to change something. Now, Grisham, uh, even though. He's a light heavyweight. He's big. He's a long and lengthy guy. He's a kickboxer. Uh, I'd say he's more technical than explosive. He's he's a counter striker. He can kind of be a low like this could be a low affair himself if they're both trying to counter strike each other. Uh, but what I do like about him more is he'll set up his counters. He'll faint a little bit, draw things out. He kind of slips and, and rips counters. I like that he goes to the body. I like that he has teep kicks up the middle. He, he's one of these guys, he throws kicks, but he's an old-school kicker where he's, he's still kicking the upper thigh. He's not going for the calves. Um, he's got some okay power. Uh, he's, he's strong in the clinch, but he was he, he was out-muscled by Marcin Tybora in that match, but uh, I think that's just being a smaller guy against a, a – just Tybora is big. Yeah, Tybora is big, and he's also he's good. Yeah. Uh, but he can get some takedowns, some trips, some judo throws. He, he will shoot for a takedown. He, he showed good takedown defense against a good wrestler in Jordan Johnson, but then he looked terrible in takedown defense against William Knight, which is, again, William Knight blew away by the William Knight rule, 13 pounds. But still, like, William Knight's not a good wrestler. Uh, I'm with you, man. It's like, this should be a pick em. This is a tough fight. I, I think Grisham might have the power advantage, and I think he might be the more technically sound striker. He's going to have to avoid some takedowns from Linz, which I am worried about. But that said... I want to go the opposite with you. I'm going to go with Grisham. I think he might have a little better uh, striking. Uh, I see we have a really close fight. Give me Grisham by split decision. There you have it. We have our first dissension of the night at UFC Vegas 61. 
We head now to a catchweight contest in the women's divisions as it is Julia Stolyarenko versus the debuting Chelsea Chandler. Stolyarenko, the 29-year-old Lithuanian, is 10-6-2 overall. She's 1-3 in the UFC. Uh, joined the UFC back in summer of 2020, promptly lost her first three fights in a row, then uh, came back in July at UFC 276 and in all likelihood saved her job with a 42-second armbar submission of Jessica Rose Clark. Uh, she will look to keep the good vibes going, uh, probably just signed a new four fight deal uh, again probably literally saved her job against the debuting chandler uh chandler the young woman from stockton 209 yes she is a uh diaz brothers protege is nice. four and one overall and she actually lost her professional debut she has won four straight since then all in invicta uh on her way to being i mean she wasn't the champ but was if she had stayed, would in all likelihood become the Invicta Featherweight champ in her next fight. Instead, she's here in the UFC and she's fighting at 140 because nobody wants to fight at Featherweight in the UFC. They are all just absolutely just loath and terrified to fight at 145 pounds. Uh, worth noting that Stolyarenko is stepping in for Leah Letson, who, man, I thought Letson retired after the... Uh, <laughs> I thought let him retired after the Felicia Spencer fight, but apparently uh, it was supposed <laughs> she retired to be mid fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, it was supposed to be Chandler versus Letson at uh, 145, but instead we get Stolyarenko versus Chandler at 140. If you ask me, this is a much much harder fight for Chandler in every way. Stolyarenko. I mean, famously, Keith and I have slightly disagreed on her. Like, he thinks she's she's bad, and I think she's terrible. But I think she's better than, than Leah Letson. And Chandler also now has to come in five pounds lighter than she was expecting. Uh, I mean, this for me is more of a, of a referendum on what Chandler's upside is. I mean, she is she's young she's not very experienced. I mean, four and one, that's barely contender she's, series material. I don't think she's that young, though. Well, uh, no, I, I mean, yeah, I'd like yeah, young she, in she's, the sport. Yeah, young in the sport. Young in the sport. Uh, I mean, she's older than the Stolyarenko. Like 30, 31, something like that. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's a referendum on what her upside is. And that includes which division she wants to compete in. Because if she is bent on making 135, then I, you know, I guess she can just sort of get in line with everyone else. It, it's a pretty wide open division, but it's not like non existent wide open like 145 is. And. Stolyarenko, like she's a she's gonna be a good test for that. Obviously, uh, Stolyarenko's she's a willing striker, and to her credit, like I think her striking is ugly, but she's willing to throw. Like she's not, you know. We just got finished talking about what feels like three straight fights of of people that just don't throw enough volume. Stolyarenko, for as long as she's on the feet, will throw enough volume. She throws hard. She has some natural power that just sort of overcomes the the lack of technique, especially in her punches. But what she mostly wants to do is armbar you, and that's what she did all the way up coming up in lithuania and other eastern european uh countries it's what didn't work at the ufc level until she ran into jesse clark that just never met an opponent's game plan she didn't want to like help along uh <clears throat> i i find it hard to believe chelsea chandler will do that chandler is big and strong she is a good grappler like i i, I However this ends, I don't see her just diving right into Stolyarenko's wheelhouse. I think if this does go to the ground, it's going to be where and how Chandler wants it. So I think this is probably just going to kind of turn into an ugly slugfest on the feet. Oh, I, I should have mentioned the odds. This one's a, a dead pick em as of the beginning of fight week. They're both minus 110, and I feel that's probably appropriate. Uh, Chandler is a big question mark right now, and Stolyarenko isn't a big question mark. She's kind of a known quantity, but like I said, it, it's an appropriate test. Uh, give me a Stolyarenko here. I can't believe I'm picking Julia Stolyarenko in a fight, but she's more proven against top-level fighters. Yeah. And she's not the one, like, moving down in weight from where she fought her last fight. You know, her last fight was at 135 against the 135-er, who actually used to be 125. Uh, give me Stolyarenko to just land more of her, her like, ugly haymakers. 
uh, if they go to the ground, you know, maybe to hold her own there and to have enough gas to probably be the fresher fighter by the end. So give me Stolyarenko probably by winning two rounds to one. Yeah. Um, you said that the odds are pick them until, until someone does an interview with Chandler and, and more people find out that she trains with uh, the Diaz brothers, then all, then the hot money would be coming in on her. Oh you my know? goodness. <laughs> uh, um, yes. Yeah, I don't know if you remember how I picked, sorry, my dog is like going crazy underneath my feet right now. If you see like the computer get knocked around, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if you remember how I picked Story Olympia last time. I'm like, yeah, she's due, so I'm going to take her. Um, she's she's a, she's a weak athlete. As mentioned before, she's she's a bit of a brute. Uh, she's she's flat-footed, but she has a good volume. You mentioned it. She has a very, like, herky-jerky style, where, very unorthodox. She throws a lot of winging shots. He's, she's got decent power, and that's because she has a good base underneath her. But she's got a lot of defensive flow. She drops her hand. She's one to eat a shot uh, to try to move forward. She will step in the pocket and throw down, and she's going to draw a fight out of you. She's got a large arsenal of kicks. She likes to pressure using that Superman punch to close the distance. She's strong in the clinch. She can grind inside. Uh, though she was a little out-muscled by Yana Kuniskaya, which still, it, it, I've kept that in my notes for a while because that was that was a little surprising. Uh, that might have been just being a smaller woman. Um, she, she does well to uh, land some strikes inside the clinch, knees, elbows. She's a strong grappler. She's, uh, she plays a lot of BJJ off her back. She's so comfortable there, and she's willing to do anything to get the fight to the ground. She'll, she'll pull guard. She'll end the roll. Uh, but she's on top. She, she likes to, to pass to a better position. You mentioned it. Ambar is like her it's like it's like her finishing move you know it's her her <laughs> Brit, hit that heart sharpshooter like she gets you in that it's over and you bet I like you mentioned this boy she has good cardio like she's got to push the whole 50 minutes Chandler I mean she's big she's thick like she's a thick woman oh and uh, real quick she is she is 28 she'll be 29 in January so a little younger than Solyarenko but still old oh, she's to have only have five fights oh, okay I'm sorry so yeah. she's a little it's a little younger than I thought but um she's She's street certified. She's from Stockton, yeah. so she's got. Extra I mean, she, she probably got four hundred fights in the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, she's she's a thick woman. Like she's, it might be hard for her to make one forty. I'm not sure about that, but um, she she looks like a featherweight. She's she's yeah. a southpaw who's very aggressive on the feet. She wings hard power shots, just coming at you with high volume. There was a lot of overhand lefts. Uh, she closes the distance. She likes to grind and clinch. Uh, likes clinch takedowns. She doesn't have like the judo background that Stolyarenko does, but I've seen her get some nice takedowns there. But she's a good grappler. Good top control. Uh, good back takes. Uh, she did get clipped in her last fight. It was a little troublesome to me. Um, the, the broadcast kept saying that she slipped, but I actually thought she got clipped. Uh, as far as prediction, like, I, yeah, I, I get why this is a leaving match fight. Like, I'm not high on either one of these females. They're both kind of minus athlete. Uh, but I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go with Chandler. Uh, I like her aggressiveness on the feet. I think she can uh, maybe match Solyarenko's aggression there, maybe even back her up, being that she's slightly bigger. The other thing that, that bothers me about Solyarenko is she's willing to fight off her back. And if she pulls guard or she tosses up submissions, she can give away rounds. Just And having Chandler, who has – I mean, I know she's a uh, Cesar Gracie purple belt. But one thing you got to remember about the Cesar Gracie team – they're historically known they for under being, they underbelt their fighters. Exactly. Hard. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Like they're the opposite of the Nogueira brothers, you know, Chael Sonnen and Shoko, the Nogueira brothers, you know, like Nate was submitting guys when he was a purple belt, submitting black belts. I think, I think yeah. Nate was a purple belt or maybe a brown belt when he, when he caught Pellerino, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, I have zero confidence in my pick, but 209 is, is, is on fire. So let's do it again. Let's go with Chandler by split decision. There we go. Next up, we have a lightweight matchup between Jesse Ronson and Joaquim Silva. Ronson, the 36-year-old Canadian who goes by the body snatcher, is 21, 11, sorry, is 21 and 11 with one no contest overall. He is 0 and 4 with one no contest in the UFC. That one no contest was a quick submission win over Nicholas Dalby that was overturned when Ronson tested positive for PEDs. We'll get back to that record in a minute. He had been scheduled to fight Vince Pichel. Pichel was forced to pull out of the fight because, of course, he was because he's Vince Pichel. In step Silva. 
The 33-year-old Brazilian is 11 and 3 overall. He is 4 and 3 since joining the UFC out of the fourth season of The Ultimate Fighter Brazil. Uh, he is on a two-fight losing streak. Uh, that is a second-round loss uh, via TKO to Nazrat Hakparast back in 2019, and a first-round TKO or a first-round KO at the hands of Ricky Glenn last June at UFC on ESPN Korean Zombie versus Ige. Uh, he steps in. He is actually the mild favorite here. He's out there minus 150 or so. Ronson plus 115. Uh, most of the problems with this fight and with these two fighters, I already told you guys in the last 60 seconds as I introduced them. Uh, Ronson is 0-4 in the UFC with one no contest. If he loses to Silva, he will tie the all-time record for most appearances in the UFC without a win. If he goes 0-5 in the UFC, you know, not counting the no contest, obviously, that will tie the record for the most UFC appearances without a win. I'm going to put you on the spot, Keith. Do you know who that will tie him with? Uh, uh, Tiki? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Well, uh, it will tie him with John Alessio. John Alessio Thanks. doesn't have a win in the UFC? Nope. He went 0-5 wow. in the UFC. Yeah. yeah John, he's actually but, not that bad, though. He wasn't that no, he wasn't yeah. that bad. He just got got matched kind of rough and then, you know, got cut, never never yeah. got the call back, never got another chance. But yeah, cuz I was kind of thinking, well, who who else like famously, you know, like Ed Deweese lost 3 times and was gone. Jason Reinhardt lost 3 times. Yeah. These Look days there're plenty of people, but yeah. I I asked Jay Petri, the Sure dog associate editor and all around stats guy. By the way, if you're watching this, if you don't read his fight facts columns, you're shortchanging yourself because it's how you become the smartest guy in the room. But yeah, That's Ronson right. has the chance here to match the kind of record nobody wants to match. And he's going against Silva. And the fact that I talked to you about Silva's two fight losing streak and it dates back three years is most of Silva's problem. Silva joined the UFC in 2015 and he has seven fights in eight years. He is 33 years old, and he has the same number of total fights as Mackenzie Dern. He has never fought more than twice in a calendar year. He's just a guy that has been prone to long layoffs, uh, sometimes due to injury, sometimes due to just whatever else he was doing. But he's just never... Like, he, he showed promise when he got to the UFC, but he's just never fought enough to, to really you know, to, to really put anything together and make a splash in such a deep division. And then in his last two fights, again, to hack Prast and Glenn, he was matched against pretty tough guys and he got splattered both times. I mean, Silva, for a guy whose nickname is, is Neto BJJ, <laughs> BJJ does not figure heavily into his game, at least at the UFC level. Like, you look back into his early record, you see some subs there, but... He reminds me a little bit of a guy that we're going to talk about further up the card, uh, Francisco Trinaldo, in that you know that like there's some grappling in the background somewhere, but mostly what he is at lightweight is a short, stocky, jacked guy that throws really hard punches. Does, does Neto maybe stand for like no? Like no BJJ? <laughs> Neto, like, just, there's just like a little Ghostbusters like red slash yeah. through. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe he's that's just some like you know 4D chess. He's trying to throw his opponents off. That's but uh, it's like, uh, like one punch picket. Yeah, <laughs> Brad, one punch picket. Where yeah, I'm gonna throw one punch and then take you down, <laughs> hold you down for the next four minutes. Join the not going on his limit. Yeah. I mean. Talk to me about this fight. Tell me who you think wins. I, I, uh, I I'm not even going to ask you if either of these guys has much upside because they're both in their late or they're both in their yeah. mid to late thirties. Ronson is nearing record breaking levels of futility in the division, and his one win was roided up at welterweight. So yeah, the, the, the good thing is that Silva is not going with the record, and he hasn't won in in four years. So that's nope. uh, that's always exciting to get. Uh, Silva has tight inside boxing. I like that. He uses feints. Oh, again, when I my notes about him are spread out over, like you mentioned, seven years. So yeah, how how I mean, I just you're trying to find something to talk about these guys. So uh, uh, you know, he has tight inside boxing. He uses feints well. He'll throw some spinning attacks. He does hit hard. I'll give him that. Uh, he has hard kicks to the body, but he doesn't handle pressure well. 
and he's been knocked out in his last two fights, which is which is really troublesome. Again, as you mentioned, good competition. I mean, Ricky Rick Glenn was his last fight. Like that's Rick Glenn stuff. Um, who was it? Uh, Hawk Peras before and, that, and, and Hawk Peras back in like 2019. Like but he was, he like was like scary his first couple fights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he isn't a strong wrestler, but you mentioned he is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Again, you never see it. Rodson, he's a minus athlete. He's a southpaw who who marches forward. He just pressures well. Like, he has good volume, uh, tight inside boxing, but he's slow, like, really slow. Uh, doesn't, like, rechamber his punches well. He's got some decent power, but a lot of defensive holes. Chin high in the air, lacks head movements. Uh, he will shoot for, like, a takedown, but he's not a strong wrestler. He's a weak defensive wrestler. Uh, to his credit, he was getting up against Rafi Garcia until he got submitted, and he has seven sub wins. So <laughs> I kind of was hoping you'd go first because I have no idea about this fight. Uh, this fight is bad. Give, I, I, give me give me Ronson by decision. Okay. There, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Upset. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not high on either. I, I think Silver is, is the better boxer. I think he hits harder. But Ronson will have the volume. <sighs> I wouldn't be shocked if, if Silva starches him or uh, subs him. <laughs> However, oh, man, they both are really bad. Like, I, I wrote in my notes, Ronson, the, the split decision, and like my, I'm just reading that and saying, "You're not really taking Ronson, are you?" <laughs> like, no, I'll take the other guy. And then I'm sitting there, and I'm like, "You really want to take Silva?" Uh, you know what? I say we get history gets done. Give me, I'll switch my pick. I'll, I'll take Silva. Uh, nice split decision. We head now to the middleweight division for a matchup between Christoph Yatko and Brendan Allen. Yatko, the 33 year old pole, is 24 and 5 overall. He's 11 and 5 in the UFC. He is uh, on a two-fight win streak, those being a split decision over Misha Serkinov last October and a unanimous decision over Gerald Mearshart uh, this April at UFC on ESPN Font versus Vera. He'll try to make it three straight against uh, Allen, who was on a two-fight win streak of his own. The 26-year-old Wisconsin native by way of South Florida is 19-5 and five overall. He is 7-2 and two since joining the UFC out of the third season of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, that aforementioned two-fight win streak is a second-round submission of Sam Alvey back in February, then a unanimous decision over Jacob Malkoon at UFC 275 in June. Odds on this one are fairly close, but Yatko is the slight favorite. He's minus 130. Allen available at even money, plus 100. Keith, the, these are two fighters that I feel as though I've gotten the wrong narrative in my head about. Like, Yatko is the perfect example of how to cruise along to a surprisingly successful UFC career and just never really distinguish yourself or pop up on the radar. And it's for two reasons. One, he doesn't fight often enough. Like, the only time he's fought three times in a calendar year in the UFC is all the way back in 2016. Since then, it's been once or twice a year. And again, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Even if you're winning a lot of fights, uh, you know, if you're just fighting twice a year, you're going to get passed up by more active people that are just in front of the people's eyeballs more often, that are on the matchmaker's radar more often, that Dana White is talking about in post-fight pressers more often. And then he's had the tendency to drop fights at inopportune times. You know, he had a he had a three-fight losing streak a couple years ago, but you know, it was against David Branch when Branch was still scary, Uriah Hall and and Brad Tavares. Like none of those were terrible losses. Since then he's five and one. The only loss is to Sean Strickland, who came within a fight of like a title shot. And he's been beating good guys, like also been beating bad guys. But Gerald Mearshart, you know, is a guy that's, you know, had been sneaking up on the rankings. In fact, I think Yako might be in our rankings right now. He might be number 14 or number 15 at middleweight. And that's as much an indictment of the middleweight division as, you know, praise of him. But he's kind of puttered along under the radar to he really is more than just another guy. You know, he, he's a, a either ranked or borderline ranked middleweight. And this is a surprisingly high stakes fight. On the flip side, there's something in the back of my mind that calls Allen a bust, but he's seven and two in the UFC and he's still just 26 years old. 
Like, who's he lost to in the UFC? Sean Strickland, who, again, was a, you know, on his way to being a top five fighter. And by the way, it was out of their weight class. It was like 195 pound catch weight. And then he got knocked out by Chris Curtis last December. And while I, you know, I don't want to apply a narrative to it in hindsight, because it certainly was a shocking outcome at the time. Like in hindsight, Chris Curtis feels kind of like a man of destiny at that time. I, I almost feel like he would have knocked out almost anyone they put in front of him those first couple fights in the UFC. Um, like he's not looked bad. And in between, he's beaten good people. He beat Kyle Dawkins. He beat Puna Soriano. He beat Jacob Malkoon, who I can't remember your pick, but I actually picked Malkoon to beat him. Like these are two guys that are, this is a more relevant fight than I thought it was when I started doing study for it. Uh, I mean, tell me if you agree with that on any level and tell me who you think wins this one. Yeah, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. This is uh, probably, other than the main event, this is probably the most relevant fight in the card. Like, this probably should be the co-main event. If you just go by credentials and who's fighting, um, this should be a co-main event. Um, Brandon Allen, yeah, they, I think the jury saw him because you mentioned he is only 26. He's beat some big guys. He's lost some tough fights. Uh, he's he. He was one of these guys when he first came to UFC. Like I, I kind of did the opposite of Brent Allen than most people, where a lot of people were super high on Brent Allen coming off of LFA, and I wasn't. And he's kind of grown on me. And I think it might be one of those pleasant surprises where I didn't have high expectation. That's why I don't feel disappointed in him, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, he's a high output striker. He's a pressure striker. He's one of these guys, he's for the middleweight division, he uses cardio as a weapon. Uh, he fights behind a high high guard defense. He does keep his chin a little high, which I don't like. Uh, he also makes a mistake of overextending or overthrowing his shots. Uh, and he's been hurt a lot in his young career. But he's got some good pop. And at 26, like, I'm not even sure he's even reached the maximum power yet. He's got a great kicking game that continues to improve. He likes to go to the body. He likes to go to the head. And his calf kicks are some of the best in the game. Uh, I mean, he was. you mentioned one of his losses against Sean Strickland. He was having success with his kicks against a, a good striker in Sean Strickland. Uh, he will look for a takedown, but he's more of a, like a funk style grappler than a pure, you know, power through your hips kind of guy, where he kind of gets in these really wild uh, scrambles. But if he gets on top, he he's he's he hits hard. He's got a mean ground and pound. Uh, he will chase submission and, and lose position. I don't like, but he did hit that beautiful heel hook. Now, uh, Yako, he's a southpaw who. He's pretty athletic. I think he's a little underrated his athleticism. He's got some quick hands. He keeps everything tight. He uses movement really well to keep his distance. And he also, like, he, he throws, like, a check hook uh, and circles away, cuts angles well. He doesn't like being pressured and forced on his back foot. And that's because he's a little bit of a point fighter who wants to work from the outside. He's not a big cracker. And if he's pressured too much though he'll crash the pocket like he wants to be all the way out all the way and he'll crash the pocket he'll start working the clinch he'll grind away victories I and mean, he did it against eric anders he did it against david branch now again that's going back a little bit but um those are just two that stick in my mind uh, i i'm impressed with his takedown defense impressed with his hip patrol when he gets in there he's good at winning scrambles uh but he has been rocked sometimes so this really depends on what kind of fight we get i think if if, if we get a slow paced sparring session then Christoph Jaco should win. If we get an in the cloach grinding clinch battle, Christoph Jaco should win. But Allen has to turn this into a dog fight. He's got to get in his face and slug it out a little bit. He's got to draw, you know, make this a fight. And if he does that, if he stays in Jaco's face and, and just kind of keeps the pressure on him, doesn't let him get comfortable, uh, I actually think Allen might have uh, the power advantage. I think he lands the biggest shots. Uh, I actually think he might drop him one or two times. I think Allen wins in in a pretty good, fun back and forth fight. Give me Allen by decision. Awesome, yeah. I'm definitely one of those that kind of stamped Allen as a future contender as soon as he made it into the UFC, based purely on the eyeball test, and probably didn't do my homework well enough. I just looked at him and I saw someone cut from the same basic mold as, as Luke Rockhold, like a big, physically imposing middleweight that had some defensive holes in his boxing but like good kicking and a good ground game like especially good topside ground game and i was like yeah he's he'll be the next luke rockhold and i just didn't pay attention for the next two years and i'm like oh okay he, he hasn't quite hasn't quite fulfilled that yet uh but like i said you know as i'm kind of looking over his his uh previous ufc fights on the way up to this i'm like he hasn't looked that bad and then the fights where he has gotten beaten i mean no loss is great but 
they're explainable losses, you know, and I think if he fights Chris Curtis again later this year, he probably beats him. You know, I don't know about Sean Strickland, but uh, here, yeah, I, I see the dynamic the, the same way you do. My concern and the reason that I'm leaning Yatko, even though I see the, you know, the fight hinging on the same things you do, is I think like Yatko isn't great at forcing his game on people, but Allen is still sometimes a little too willing to accept the fight that his opponent wants. That's something that, I mean, he probably will grow out of as he gets uh, older and more experienced, or if he doesn't, that's what will define his limit in the division. But for right now, I do think Yatko is going to be a little too much too soon. Like I'm being chicken here because I feel like this fight is a pick em. You had the guts to, to pick Allen, but I'm saying Yatko wins and it's yeah it, it's probably a fun fight and a competitive one all three rounds but without the explosive moments that would that we would need to see if it were going to be an allen win so give me yako by decision in this one next up at ufc vegas 61 is a bantamweight matchup between guido canetti and randy costa Canetti, the 42-year-old Argentinian, is 9-6 and six overall. He's 3-5 and five in the UFC. Uh, he did win his last time out. That was a first-round TKO of Chris Moutinho. Uh, that allowed him to put the brakes on a three-fight losing skid against Marlon Vera, Batgari Dana, and uh, Leomana Martinez. He'll try to make it two straight against uh, Costa, the 28-year-old from Taunton, Massachusetts. The... Uh, Disciple of Joe Lozon is six and three overall. He's two and three in the UFC. He has lost his last two fights. Those were both second round TKOs at the hands of Adrian Yanez last July and Tony Kelly last December. Uh, so he's going to try to get back on track. He is overwhelmingly favored to do so. He's minus 300, uh, Kennedy plus 240 as one of the biggest, uh, one of the widest betting lines on the card, though not the widest. We'll get to that one in a little bit. I, I tell you what, you know, this is not a betting program as we never hesitate to remind people, uh, you know, like we say who's going to win the fight. And if we tell you what the odds are and we say who's going to win the fight, there's a natural amount of, you know, implied betting advice there. It is not explicit betting advice. Bet responsibly. And the first like the first step in betting responsibly is don't bet based solely on our advice. Uh, having said that, if there's any value here, it's Kennedy at plus 240 against Costa. Like Costa has every reason to dominate this fight. He yeah. is bigger. He is much younger. I mean, he's he's 14 years younger. You don't see 14 year age gaps at Bantamweight. You know, no. you get that at heavyweight when like Fabricio Verdum or Andre Arlovsky is like fighting Jared Vandera. You don't get that at Bantamweight. But, you know, and like Costa's bigger. He's faster. Uh, he's better on the ground. He's got a huge reach advantage. But Kennedy has retained surprising amounts of athleticism for his age. Like, it, it's shocking kind of how quick and athletic he still is for a 42-year-old. And there's if there's one thing that defines Kennedy's game to me, it's that he swings hard and he hits super hard. And if there's one thing that defines Costa's game as far as weaknesses, is that he fights way too wild and he gets cracked cleanly by everyone he fights, good or bad. That adds up to enormous upset potential here. Like Costa should steamroll this man, but if Costa's sleeping in two and a half minutes, is anyone that shocked? Like that's that's all that Kennedy can do, and that's what Costa gives everyone a chance to do. Like Costa's last two w lo losses, okay, Adrian Yanez, that's a bad matchup because Yanez is a composed, sharp boxer with power, and Costa's a wild man. Kelly, like. Costa has that fight over again. I bet he can beat Tony Kelly. Like he he gave Tony Kelly the perfect chance chance to win, and I think he's going to do the same for Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy was on that three fight losing streak, but Marlon Vera and Dana Batkari are rough matchups. Like yeah. you know, Marlon Vera is a top five guy, Dana is a top fifteen guy, and then he he almost beats Leomana Martinez, who you know, Martinez. He's not a complete product. He's got some holes in his game, but he's a long, rangy striker who hits super hard, and Kennedy was in his face the whole time. 
he got a reprieve in the form of Chris Matinho. Like for that reason, I'll, I'll always be glad that the UFC signed Matinho. But I'm not calling the upset here. I'm just saying that I sprinkle a little bit. Just get a sprinkle. <laughs> just <not> a sprinkle. <laughs> just sprinkle. Just get a sprinkle. Uh, I mean, give me Costa in in this one. You know, he's gonna come out. Maybe on a two fight losing streak, Joe Lozon is going to say, you don't have to fight like me. You know, like I, I like I love Joe Lozon. He is he is amazing. But Joe Lozon made a career out of being one of the greatest round one overachievers in UFC history. Like most of his best wins are him beating better fighters in round one. Uh, Costa doesn't have to do that. If Costa just fights a composed kickboxing battle against Kennedy, or if he tries to take Kennedy down, like Costa has one of the most underused ground games in the UFC right now. If he does either of those things, he cruises to an easy three round, round win over Kennedy. I, I, I don't trust him to do that. I think he's going to oblige Kennedy with a wild brawl sometime in the first round. I'm going to be like biting my nails the whole time and I'm not putting money on it. But, uh, you know, Give me Costa to survive that. Take over late, even though Costa is much bigger. Uh, one thing, like Kennedy's gas tank is like starting to tell on him a little bit. He did <laughs> so Costa have... though. For for two different reasons, you know. Yeah. There, there's two factors: it's how big the tank is and how hard you step on the gas. Uh, and Kennedy's got both problems. You know, he's over 40 and he he does fight at a wild pace, whereas Costa just fights at a wild pace. You know, Costa doesn't step on the gas; he just lights his whole car on fire. And you know, <laughs> uh, but give me Costa to you know, withstand the early onslaught and have enough left in the tank to hold on and win this. Uh, give me Costa by decision, but this should be a really fun one. More fun yeah. than it needs to be. <clears throat> yeah, Costa, he's a striker and, and he's a good striker. He's got these really long arms. We'll talk about this. He has like a Chuck Liddell type body <laughs> where he's good. And he also kind of strikes like him where he throws from weird angles and lands. Uh, he's got good vision. He can fight out of both stances. He uses feints really well. Uh, both hands and like hip hip feints. He's accurate. He hits hard. Uh, he throws kicks at his combos. He has some hard leg kicks. He had that he had that beautiful high kick on, on Journey Newsom. Very uh, very Robert Whitaker dipped to one side style. He doesn't like being pressured though. Like Brandon Davis, Adrian Giannis, Tony Kelly. They all beat him with pressure and gassing himself out. Um, Tony Kelly was a, a perfect example. Uh, he was hurt to the body in both fights. Again, his last two losses, Jonas and, and, and Kelly. He will look to wrestle a little bit, but again, he isn't a strong wrestler, but he does have good takedown defense. Like, that, like Costa's is hard to take down. Kennedy, he's 42, and I mean, the floor could fall on him anytime. He's not very explosive anymore. His hand speed is slowing. But he does have tight inside striker, but he's one of these guys he wants to brawl. Uh, his left hook is his best strike. He has power. I mean, he hurt Marlon Vera in, in their fight. He he put Chris Martino out, uh, something that Sean O'Malley you know, took him three rounds to do. Guido did quickly. He's He's got some good hard kicks to body, uh, hard leg kicks. He, he does throw some naked leg kicks, so he's open to counters. He will miss it in takedowns from the clinch and from distance, but I'm worried about his chin. I mean, he was hurt several times by Vera. He was knocked out, but, but now Benai uh, Baccarel, um, he, he did eat some shots from Mata Martinez, who's known for his power. He didn't go out to us like that, but at 42, uh, that's troublesome. A, a year ago, if you asked me, to pick this matchup, I would have laughed at you and and said, "Oh, Costa's Costa's going to smash him." Um, Costa looked bad in his last two fights, and that said, uh, Kennedy looked pretty good in his last fight. Uh, gave Ronda Martinez a better for than most people thought, uh, but I'm not sold on him. Like it, it, it's Chris Martino. Martino's not good. I think. I actually think it, you said that Carlson might have to handle an onslaught from Kennedy, and, and that could be too. But like, it wouldn't shock me if Costa comes out guns blazing, and then he fades. And actually, Kennedy's the one with the deep cast. Think like I, I don't put that out of the realm of possibility. Um, that said, I, I trust Costa's power. I, I think he lands a big shot early. I don't trust Kennedy anymore. Uh, I think he catches Kennedy. I think I think Costa's going to have that like that early showing that he did when he first kind of came on the UFC scene. So give me Costa my first round knockout. There you go. Uh, 
and for the record, I I had the feeling that Costa's job is safe here, win or lose. He's the kind of guy that's going to get every chance to stick around. One, because he's a Lausanne disciple and Lausanne is a legendary company man. Also, Costa, he's got a little bit of a personality. Yeah, he's great a good looking dude. He's got a weird nickname. He's a guy that could, I mean, fun, he could settle. Fun fighter. Fun style. fighter, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he could settle in as one of those, uh, I can't remember his name now. The welterweight that was the magazine model. Alan Joban? Yeah, Alan Joban. The guy that's like like one of the best looking guys in the division, but fights like he doesn't give a damn about his face. Like that that type. Like, <laughs> the Bantamweight Alan Joban. Alan Joban, there you go. Next up at UFC Fight Night 211, it is the lightweights as Mike Davis takes on short notice replacement Vyacheslav Borshov. Davis, the 29-year-old New Yorker, uh, sorry, from New York State. He's from Cairo, New York, which I had to look it up. It's uh, near Albany. Anyway, the 29-year-old from New York State is 9-2 and two overall. He is 2-1 and one since joining the UFC as a veteran of the second season of Dana White's Contender Series. Incidentally, he lost to Sadiq Yusuf on that uh, on that season, uh, went back and won a couple more fights in the Northeast, then signed with the UFC back in 2019. He lost his debut to uh, Gilbert Burns because that is a hell of a debut, but has come back uh, since then with back to back wins over Thomas Gifford and Mason Jones. If you're having a tough time remembering those, it's because those two wins are spaced out over the last three years. Uh, the Gifford win was back in October of 2019. The Jones win was uh, last January. So this is the first time in almost two years that Davis has stepped into the octagon. He was scheduled to take on Urosh Medic. Medic had to withdraw a couple weeks ago uh, with an injury. In steps uh, Borshov. The 30-year-old Russian by way of Sacramento, he is a Team Alpha Male product, is 6-2 and two overall. He is 1-1 one and one since joining the UFC uh, out of last season of Dana White's Contender Series. He debuted with a knockout of Dakota Bush back in January, then dropped a unanimous decision to Mark Jacquesi in March at UFC on ESPN Blades vs. Dawkins. Uh, odds on this one? Davis, a comfortable favorite. He is minus 190. Borshov, plus 155 on the comeback. Uh, Keith, it's it's not the matchup we were expecting, but uh, arguably it's a more interesting fight. Uh, who you got in this one? Yeah, I actually think Mike Davis got a much tougher opponent than, than the original opponent. Uh, Mike Davis was one of these guys. That I, I really liked him. Oh, on the wait, wait a sec. I just got a text from... Uh, Anchorage BJJ telling us we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. I like those guys. <laughs> me too. Like me too. But like th this won't even go out for like 10 days, but I just got a text now. Like, you know, they're like their, their, their spidey sense went off. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Davis is a guy that I liked in the container. I, he's been so inactive that I kind of forgot about him, but he's mm -hmm. a well, he's a well-rounded fighter. When we last seen him. He, he's got a lot of experience, both boxing and Muay Thai. He's a pressure counter striker that is probably more technical than explosive. He throws a lot of feints to draw out attacks, a very crisp striking, great slip and rip style, excellent head mover. He just kind of slips out of range, counters with his own shots. Uh, one of the best jabs in the division, good counter right hand, good at picking up his opponent's timing. He's accurate. I like that he digs the body. He adds kicks into his combinations. When he's in the pocket, he he likes to grab the back of the head. He got a really good plum clinch. He understands that Muay Thai where he just be pulling down the head, blasting these up the middle, blasting these to the head, getting all the way up to the head. Uh, he's he's excellent um, at um, well, nah, I'm gonna skip that. He, he he's he keeps his head off the center line really well, and he's got a large arsenal of strikes, which which I really like. Uh, he's got some good timing on his double legs. Like he's like underrated wrestler. He'll he, more reactionary. If you kind of overthrow a punch, he'll dro drop down. Good double leg, uh, really strong. He'll lift up his opponent, slam to the ground, and he's got some pretty good ground pound. Like overall, he's a good fighter. Um, Barshev, he's an incredible striker. He uh, he's a kick. K1 kickboxing champion, fast, explosive, accurate, really good jab, follows it up with tight, powerful, hard hooks, good head movement where he just slides his head off the center line, comes back, 
uh, with good counters, rips the body. That's a big part of the strategy. I mean, he he murdered Dakota Bush with with body shots, incredible uh, kicks, kicks everywhere, good power. He he does have some defensive flaws though. Like he's got that traditional kickboxing style where he stands up really high. Um, he's been rocked before, even like the Chris Duncan fight. Chris Duncan dropped him with a calf kick, and he's a terrible defensive wrestler. Mark D. Casey took him down 11 times. I mean, uh, so if, if if this fight stays standing, this will be a really fun stand-up war. I mean, this this is, technically speaking, this might be the best fight of the card. Um, it, it isn't in a sense of rankings and, and moving forward and, and, you know, they're both kind of way down in, in the rankings and not close to a title shot or anything like that. But just the skill set of these guys on the feet, it could be really, really fun stand-up wall. However, if this stays standing, Mike Davis is an idiot. <laughs> like, why give a bar chef any chance of winning a fight? Why stand and bang on? That's his only route to victory. I can't imagine Davis and his team watching the, the Mark D. Casey fight and not using the same exact strategy. And Davis is probably, we've talked about D. Casey's underrated grappler. We've talked about, but, like on paper, Davis is a better wrestler than Dia Casey is, like credential wise. I I can't imagine Davis just not turning uh, Barashov, who's also taken on a short notice, just take it, turn him into a takedown dummy. Give me Davis by decision. You said it all better than I could because I also went immediately to the Dia fight because that's one where I think we both picked Borshov. and for me, it was because. I didn't trust Jacezy to do that. I was like, Jacezy is exactly the kind of fighter that's going to try to knock Borshev out and is going to get knocked out for his trouble. Uh, and instead, no, it was it made it an ugly fight. It wasn't a super exciting fight, but also the outcome was never in question. He won all three rounds easily. And as you pointed out, unless Davis is badly diminished by, you know, the, the time off over the last couple of years, and I have no reason to believe he is, that's a, that's a game plan that he could follow at least as easily as Jacasey did, and if he employs it early, will get easier late again because Borshov is stepping up on on short notice. So I'm with you here. Davis and the team have got to be smart enough to try to take this thing to the ground as soon as possible and just keep doing it. You know, fans aren't going to go crazy, but it's the apex. What do you do? You're going to piss off 250 people. Who cares? Uh, give me uh, Davis by decision as well. I mean, if he decides to make a kickboxing match out of this, all bets are off, but I, I'm not betting on it. We head now to the featherweight division for a matchup between Sadiq Youssef and short notice opponent Don Shanus. Youssef, the 29 year old uh, Nigerian American by way of Maryland, is uh, 12 and 2 overall. He's 5 and 1 since joining the UFC out of uh, the second season of Dana White's Contender Series. He won his last time out. It was a unanimous decision over Alex Caceres that allowed him to bounce back from his first UFC loss. That was a unanimous decision loss to Arnold Allen last April. Uh, he had been scheduled to fight Giga Chikadze back on September 17th. That got bumped to this date. Uh, because Chikaze, I believe, had visa issues. Uh, and then Chikaze fell off entirely. So rather than leave Yusuf without a fight entirely, the UFC signed Shanus. The 31-year-old from Stoughton, Massachusetts, I don't know where that is, but I assume it is Greater Boston, uh, is 12 and 3 oh, overall. Oh, Stoughton. 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 Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Stoughton. Sorry. No, no, no. I was like, where's he talking about? Stout yeah, Stoughton. Okay. Stoughton from Stoughton. Uh, he's 12 and 3 overall. As I mentioned, this will be his debut. He has fought uh, primarily overwhelmingly in uh, Massachusetts promotions, Cage Titans FC uh, primarily, where he is on a five fight uh, winning streak. And he got the call. And in fact, he was saying earlier this year in interviews, you know, that his goal was to get in the UFC and have two UFC fights by the end of 2022. It looks as though that's probably going to come true unless Yusuf literally kills him. Uh, odds here. I don't know what the prop is for death, but the straight money line is Yusuf minus 900, Shanus plus 550. Here's the, here's the problem. So I will admit, like, I'm 
I had to start almost from zero on getting to know who Don Shanus was this week. Uh, I'm plugged into, I'm fairly plugged into regional scenes. You know, I do a lot of work for the Sure Dog Fight Finder. So I'm just entering random results from Kazakhstan or Michigan or Ecuador. And I, and obviously I'm very plugged into the Texas scene because I go to a lot of local shows and I know a lot of the, the people who are there. I had no idea who Don Shanus was. So I had to go look and I watched pretty, I think I watched every single one of his fights that's available. He's on a five fight winning streak. And that includes some pretty good fighters. You know, it includes, it includes uh, Chris Lencioni, who's doing pretty well in Bellator right now. It includes uh, Cody Fister. Fister? I barely knew her. It also includes Jay Ellis. The Jay Ellis. I'm just going to say, like, if you're, if you're watching this show and you don't know who Jay Ellis is. Shame on you. Shame on you. Ironically, since Shanus' nickname is Shameless, uh, he is... I believe his record is 16 and 106 right now. <laughs> and no, I'm not, I'm not, not even kidding. Yeah, I think I that's lit. And you know, he, he's got multiple like 17, 18 fight oh, losing streaks. He, he's <laughs> lost something like 29 of his last 30. And it's not, it's not a Shannon rich thing. Cause Shannon rich's problem was always gameness. He knew he had three more fights this month. So he would, I mean, the guy would tap to a fart. Like you fart in the cage, he's probably tapping because he didn't want to endanger his next couple of paychecks. That's not Jay Ellis. Jay Ellis goes out like a madman and wants to win, and he's just very, very bad at it. I, I will yeah, say he this: just does and, his training at like the bus stop and shit. Like yeah, he's, like it's it's but, yeah, come on. Like but this no, is they have like, a friend in the world that'd be like, hey Jay, no more taking fights. And I mean Keith, Keith has certain axioms that he's brought to this show. You know, like I'll I'll never pick. You know. Jordan uh, Williams, Jordan Levitt. Levitt. Jordan Levitt. Sorry, in a, in a fight until he becomes a better striker. Fighter A should not be a favorite over a minus four hundred favorite over anybody in the UFC. I'm introducing one. If one of your last three wins is over Jay Ellis, you're not ready for the UFC. <laughs> no, and it's nothing against Jay Ellis. Like I admire him. He goes out and he tries to win. Like, like I, I, the only fighters I will ever bash is where I can tell it's an obvious lack of effort. But. It's, with him, it's not that. He's just not a good fighter. But if that's if that's who you are fighting on the regional level, you're probably not ready for the UFC. I don't know if Don Shanus is ready for the UFC, but I sure as shit know he is not ready for Sadiq Youssef. Like, Sadiq Youssef is a guy with top 10 talent who's prone to in, inconsistent, like, performances, but they're not inconsistent in a way that's going... He's not even that inconsistent. The only guy he's lost to in the UFC is Arnold Allen. Yeah, I don't know. Like, that was no. really good. Yeah, Arnold Allen's really good. No, it's Sadiq Yusuf is a guy with top 10 talent who is unfortunately in a division that's so stacked that it's got 25 people with top 10 talent and only 10 can fit at once. (laughs) Like, that's really the problem. And Shanus, he is, I mean, he used to be mostly a wrestler. Now he's a wrestler who's kind of gotten a little bit of strikeritis. He... You know, he's he's a short, stocky. Like he is burly. He's he's got that uh, Chad Mendez build where he's not tall for 145, but he's broad and muscular. Uh, uh, and right. he <laughs> like a, a Chad, Chad, a poor, poor man, Chad Mendez. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he went from he went from water to diet coke. Get it. Not the like, full coke, but diet coke. Yeah. You, you know, like you ordered Chad Mendez on Wish. Okay. And, you know, and, and Don Shana shows up on, on your doorstep, there you know, you uh, it's this package says Chud Mendez. What what the fuck is this? Like, yeah. you know, um, and kind of like, a, you know, a downgraded version of Mendez is striking. Like Mendez had short arms and he for a long time didn't make things any better on himself because he'd throw a lot of looping stuff. That's also uh, Shanus. But he is he is a good wrestler, like fast, you know, entries. He's a physically strong guy. Like if he gets in on your hips, he's going to finish. He's going to finish emphatically. We're talking about a guy that fought not only at 145, but up at 155. I saw him fight at 170. I saw him fight a big dude at 170 and still just picked him up, slammed him. But these are all things that are not going to work on Sadiq Yusuf. Yusuf isn't going to hang around and get hit by, by the big looping overhand wrestler fastball special. He's certainly not going to let Don Shanus shoot in on his hips. And the more he tries any of those things, Yusuf is going to uh, punish him. Yusuf is going to kick him to the body. He's going to kick him to the legs. Uh, he's going to meet uh, takedown attempts with intercepting knees. 
I, I mean, he could just pancake a takedown attempt, spin around to the back. Yusuf has a shockingly mean, like, ground game, like, mean ground and pound. Yeah, like, I, I strongly suspect that, that Sheamus is not going to stick. I mean, he will reach his goal of fighting twice in the UFC by the end of the year because he's going to get at least one more fight for having taken this one on short notice and kind of saving the UFC's bacon. I don't know what his upside is, but this is about as rough a short notice debut as you can get just in terms of overall talent as well as style give me yusuf by first round knockout and like not even tko yusuf catches him on the feet you know or or you know again pa pancakes to take down reverses him but just leaves him out cold yusuf by first round ko yeah um yeah this is a really tough fight for don shanus um Yusuf, I mean, he's really good. He's a long and lengthy guy who's very accurate. He throws combinations. Uh, answer, answer me this while you're going. Is okay. this worse than O'Malley Moutinho or the same or better? No, no, no. It's not as bad. He, he, Sheamus is better than um, than Moutinho is. Okay. Yeah, like Shane, Moutinho is a guy I never thought would make it to the UFC. Shane, Shane is, is, is a guy that... I, I didn't think he'd make it to the UFC, but it wasn't out of the like, realm of possibility. Um, like, he's, he's got some talent, Shanus. Um, but he's not Sadiq Yusuf. I mean, Yusuf's good output, fast hands, elite jab, real good snap power on the shot. His left hook is really good, good power, has some of the best cap kicks in the game. Um, I mean, he destroyed Alex Caceres with inside leg kicks. Knees up the middle. He's an underrated wrestler. Good at winning scrambles. Uh, he did. He one defense might be is is Arnold Allen just exposed some of his defensive wrestling. But Arnold Allen is such a good, intelligent fighter. Um, he's been taken down in, in in a couple fights, but he's got some good get up game. Don Shanus, I like that he, he he left New England as far as I know, and he's trained a little bit with Glory MMA. I don't know if that's a full time thing. No, no, he's gone full time to Glory MMA. Okay, he started so that's earlier good. this year. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good, that's a really good, that's a smart move. Um, New England is, is is much as I love my home area. It's it's not it's not a hotbed for MMA. It's there's much better gyms out there. He's he's a very aggressive on his feet. He's a brawler. He has his high guard. He's got some good pop in his hands. Uh, but he's he's a brawler. I mean, he's he swings wildly. Um, not, not a lot of game planning. Uh, he throws some hard leg kicks, but he throws some naked leg kicks. He got hurt bad in his last fight. He was almost knocked out in his last fight. Um, he will wrestle a little, but he, you mentioned his wrestling. I've seen a lot of people talk about his wrestling. He's a New England wrestler. Like he's good, but not they don't hold it to the highest standard uh good good top control uh he does he, he's actually i think he's probably a better grapple than he is a wrestler like he's he's got good control on the ground he hits hard um that's his biggest strength he, he's got some good ground and pound and he, he does advance position um you could see some of that but this is a as you mentioned this is a massive step up in competition for shanice i don't i mean you, it's, it's, you gotta, would it be fair to say like mo like again i watched all of his fights today most of them were in a Chinese restaurant. Would it be fair to say uh, yeah, it's yeah, a Chinese yeah. restaurant wrestling? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. I mean, he trains at, he, he fights at, um, shout out Cage, NEF. Yeah. Cage, Cage Warriors. Cage Titans. Um, Cage Titans, excuse me. Cage uh, Titans, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that's like the number two New England one. They're like, I, I would probably put CS over him for yeah. competition. Then, I mean, it's better than reality fighting. I'll, I'll give him that. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but they they famously they book JLS all the time. Like they they have a lot of mismatches. Um, so and Yusuf, I mean Yusuf was was going to fight Giga Chikasi in a co-main event. You know now he's taking on Don Shannis. There's a chance Yusuf just blows him off, doesn't take it serious. There's also a, a, but I really only see Shannis landing a big haymaker. The deeper this fight goes, the more and more I favor Yusuf. Yusuf is a better athlete. He's faster. He's more tactical. He has more tools. He's faced a way better competition. I expect Yusuf just to pick apart with a jab, put some calf kicks until he can't eat more, and then I think Yusuf lands a big shot. I'm with you. Give me Yusuf my first round TKO. Next up, it is the Bantamweights, and yet one more fight on this card that has uh, reached this card after being kicked down the road from a previous card. It is Hani Barcelos versus Trevin Jones. Barcelos, the 35-year-old Brazilian, is 16-3 and three overall. He is 5-2 and two in the UFC. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that two are his last two fights. After winning his first five in the UFC, 
something that would have propelled him into the fringes of the rankings, even in the Bantamweight division, if not for the fact that he's been kind of injury prone and they were spaced out over a, a couple of years. Uh, he has run into his first two losses of his UFC career in the form of Timur Valiev, who beat him last June by majority decision and Victor Henry, who beat him back in January at UFC 270 by unanimous decision. He will try to make it not be three in a row against Jones. The 32-year-old Guamanian is 13 and eight with one no contest overall. He is one and two with one no contest in the UFC. Uh, his first fight in the UFC was actually a second round knockout of Valiev, which was later overturned uh, when he tested positive for cannabis. I mean, make of that what you will, but it was short notice. It's something that stays in your system for a long time. It doesn't help you win fights, and it's probably the national vegetable of Guam. I know that Guam is a U.S. territory. <laughs> like, it doesn't have a national vegetable. Uh, he then won his second UFC uh, appearance against Mario Bautista. Since then, he's dropped two in a row uh, against Saeed Yakub Kakramanov and Javid Basharat. The Basharat fight was back in March at UFC Fight Night Santos versus Ankalaev, where he dropped a unanimous decision. Uh, this fight was supposed to happen back in December. Uh, you know, it's gotten balanced. They each have gotten different fights since then. Like each of them has fought since then someone else, but they decided to come back and remake it kind of like the uh, Latifi versus Alenic fight. Uh, Barcelos is a strong favorite here. He's minus 220. Jones plus 180. Uh, Keith, I'm going to toss this to you first. What I will say is this is... I mean, only at Bantamweight do you get a fight between two fighters this good who are on two fight losing streaks. Yeah. It, like, <laughs> yeah. like two fighters this good should not be like looking over their shoulder in danger of their job. But here, here we are. Yeah, they should, should have gotten tossed the softball. I, I used to like Barcelos a lot, uh, but I think he's declining. I, I, I've seen some decline in him. Uh, he's still technically sound. He's a good counter striker. Uh, his right hand is his counter right is the best blow. He has some good leg kicks, though he doesn't really check leg kicks. But the biggest concern for me is his output has really dropped. Um, and I think that goes with his cardio. His cardio is failing him. He, his, he gassed out bad in his last two fights. Um, he, I don't know if he can fight at a – he's fighting at a snail's pace, and he's losing rounds because of it. Uh, he's, he's – he is – He's an okay wrestler, but he's got really good BJJ. Nice top control. I mean, at his prime, he outgrappled uh, Sen Nagamon Madoff, which is obviously incredibly good. And he's got really good takedown defense. But his striking is 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 concerning at this point for me. Uh, Trevor Jones has been like an overachiever in the UFC. But then it gets to the point like when a guy keeps winning, you're like, oh, maybe he's not overachieving. Like, even in losses, he hasn't looked bad. Like, uh, he went against Basharat in his last fight and yeah, he lost, but he had moments. Like he wasn't an th absolute thrashing. Uh, he's a southpaw. Who's a he's a good striker. He's a counter striker himself. He's quick. Uh, nice, nice jab. He likes his check right hook, straight left. That's like his go-to com uh, combo. Uh, he hangs his hands a little bit low, um, but he can counter. He can hurt some guys. He showed his power against Timur Valiev. He showed his power against Mario Batista. Uh, he doesn't check leg kicks, which which is an issue, and he has been hurt to the body. Like Valley have hurt him there, but he can wrestle a little bit. He's got some good timing on his reaction to double. He has four submission wins, and he showed great and toughness. Like he he showed incredible heart against a comeback against Valley of. and then even like the Basharat fight and stuff. Like he's been in these fights, so the fights he showed that even though he's outmatched, he, he he's got to bite down his mouthpiece and 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 have moments. If this fight was five years ago. Three years ago, I would take Barcelos, and I, I'd probably take him to blow up. But man, I, I'm hope this is one of these picks. And I hope I'm wrong. Um, the, well, I'm not. I not hope I'm wrong that I get the the pick wrong, but I hope that the outcome. Like I think I hope Barcelos looks a lot better than he's shown in those last two fights. Uh, I think he's lost a step, so uh, I, I'm going to go with the probably my biggest upset pick of the night. I'm going to go with Jones doing a back and forth fight where Barcelos starts to fade midway through the fight, and Jones takes over, and Jones wins the last second and third round. Give me Jones by decision. Nice. I. <laughs> The first thing I, th I thought when I saw the line for this fight is that it's tough to have that kind of faith in Barcelos. 
it's like both these guys are on two fight losing streaks, but they feel different to me. Like for for Jones, he's still kind of right there. I, I mean, you know, he debuted in the UFC and yeah, he knocked out Timur Valiev in, in the second round, but that was after getting absolutely pasted the first round. Like it was a 10-8 round on everyone's books, but you know, he weathered it, came back fresh in the second round, caught Valiev and, and put him down. You know, but then, you know, he he just flat out beat Mario Bautista in his second UFC fight. And that is an underratedly strong win. Like Bautista is like six and two in the UFC right now. And the only people he's lost to are Jones and Corey Sanhagen. Like that's it. Uh, and against Kakramanov and Basharat, like Jones still looks like the same fighter. He's just starting to, to run into maybe what his ceiling is in the UFC. Like to be, maybe he's just going to be a gatekeeper to the top 15 where he can jump up and sneak up on a Timor Valiev from time to time, but mostly he's just going to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. Barcelos looks like a completely different fighter. And, you know, Jay Petri that I said nice things about earlier in the show, now I got to give him hell because he needs to stop giving us shit about, you know, I think it was after the Nurmagomedov or the Taha fight where we just kind of said, you know, going up the top 15, whom would you favor Barcelos against right now? Because oh yeah, I, I think <laughs> oh, it was God, I think it was reasonable. Yeah, it was reasonable time. to ask those questions at that time, but he just looks like a different fighter since no. then. And you pointed out, it's there's there's nothing mysterious about it. He looks like he aged five years in five months you know, or a little more than that, from like November 2020 to June 2021, he looked like he'd aged five years, just slower. The gas tank is gone. Uh, some of the power is gone. And you can't do that against Timur Valiev. And it turns out you can't do that against Victor Henry, who's been a pleasant surprise since he arrived in, in yeah. the UFC uh, last year. Barcelos has the look of a fighter in decline. Uh, Jones has the look of a fighter who is at least holding steady as what he is. So, you know, I'm not going to let you steal all the thunder here. I'm feeling this one as well. Uh, I just, I don't trust Barcelos to win this fight if it has to go past the midway point of the second round. Like, I, I think unless he knocks Jones out in the first round or racks up a 10-8 round, in which case we're probably looking at a draw, I think at worst, Jones wins the second and third rounds and uh and pulls out the decision here and that's what i'm picking as well in i think the biggest upset i'm picking on this card next up is another men's bantamweight matchup this time it is john castaneda versus daniel santos castaneda the 30 year old american is 19 and 5 overall he is 2 and 1 since joining the ufc out of the first season of dana white's contender series and as a longtime standout in combate americas now combate global he lost his ufc debut by unanimous decision to nathaniel wood since then he's come back with back-to-back -back wins over eddie wineland and miles johns the most recent of those the johns win was a arm triangle choke submission at ufc fight night hermanson versus strickland back in february he will look to make it three straight against Santos. The 27-year-old Brazilian is 8-2 overall. He is 0-1 since joining the UFC really kind of out of nowhere. Uh, he had had some fights in uh, ACB, then its successor ACA. That's absolute championship Akhmat. But hadn't fought at all since 2019 when he suddenly got the call up to fight at UFC 273 back in April. Um, where he lost a unanimous decision to Julio Arce. I mean, it's not too much of a mystery. He's a teammate of uh, Charles de Bronx Oliveira at Shootbox Diego Lima. That's probably how and why he ended up in the UFC. He's going to get another chance to get into the win column here. He is not favored to do so. He is plus 180. Castaneda minus 210 as the, the favorite. Keith, I'm going to toss this to you first, but like... <laughs> I don't know what kind of upside Santos had. Yeah, how did I know? How did I know you're going to go to me first? On I'm, this I'm, happy to, I'm happy to talk <laughs> first about the, the guys. I'll tell you flat flat out. Santos has like he has ten fights. Like he he had a you know he had a three year layoff, and even before that, he only fought like once a yeah. year. Like just couldn't find couldn't find like eight of his fights either. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. it's really just the uh, the <laughs> uh, ACA fight. fights. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the Arce fight that that you can even find. Uh, whereas you know Castaneda, I one thirty five 
is such a crowded division. It's such a talent rich division that you can have really, really like good fighters, like well-rounded fighters, athletic fighters, skilled fighters who just, if we're being honest, they'll never have a prayer of like breaking the top 10. There's just so many other great fighters in there with them. Uh, Cassidy, that feels like one of those to me. I mean, tell me if you disagree and if you see like a uh, contender upside for either of these guys and tell me who you think wins. Yeah, Castaneda was a guy that I wasn't really high on heading into the UFC, but he's he's looked good his last two fights. I mean, the first one was like the Eddie Wyland fight was like, eh, it's Eddie Wyland, he's kind of done. But Miles Johns is is a, a quality opponent. So uh, he's a southpaw that has these deceivingly long arms. He fights with some really high output. Um, he struggled with the length of, of Nathaniel Wood, but that loss has aged really well, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Um and he looked much better against like a Miles Johns getting there, um, landing some uh, decent power. Uh, he showed in his uh, in the uh, back and forth fight, um, you know, that a lot of people weren't given much chance. Uh, hard kicks to the body from that South Point stand. He's an underrated wrestler, um, good at winning scrambles. He has seven subs on his record. Um, Santos on the other hand. <laughs> A lot of the things you got to take is just simply from the, the Arce fight. He's athletic. He's got some fast hands. He does throw some spinning attacks out there. Decent pop, um, but he's got some defensive holes. I mean, Arce was smoking him, um, hurting, hurting him. Keeps his chin high in the air. He lacks head movement. Um, he did show some takedown defense, which I like that against Arce. You know, stuff some takedowns for Arce, but um, I'm going to go in Castaneda. Uh, I think he lands the power shots. Give me him by decision. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you here. Like, Santos just, he has the feel of, of a raw prospect who does have some athletic upside, but he feels like a fighter that with barely 10 fights. Just, I I don't know why, because especially a Brazilian that's 28 and is kind of with a good team and has this kind of obvious athleticism, most of the time they have twice this many fights. Like, even if they've just sent them to, like, the, you know, the... Uh, Astra or, you know, the Aspera <laughs> FC, like puppy yeah, mill, yeah. and yeah, have, yeah. Them fighting, have them fighting like two and 11 fighters, at least getting them reps in there and they show up to the UFC <laughs> like. Get you Jay Ellis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, or, you know, Joao Ellis or whatever the Brazilian equivalent of him is called. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the guy shows up at the UFC like, you know, 17 and three and, rather than seven and, and, and one, you know. Uh, but yeah, C- Castaneda, he is a good fighter and uh you know uh good you know deceptive power in his hands you mentioned the the nathaniel wood uh loss his age well i agree he was competitive and not only has wood looked great since then he's moved up to featherweight since then you know like all all in all that that yeah that's a good point tell on castaneda at all for him to manage an arm triangle choke on miles johns like a, a topside like kind of bully submission on a guy who's as strong, physically strong and is as good a wrestler mm-hmm. as John's like told me a lot. If he can do that to John, he can absolutely do that kind of thing to Santos. But also you mentioned Julio Arce, like busted up Santos on the feet. And that's something that Castaneda could absolutely do as well. Uh, give me Castaneda to win this one going away. I think he's going to pull further ahead like as the fight goes along. And not only would I not be surprised, I'm going to actually call for it here. Give me Castaneda to uh, get a late finish. It could be a submission. I'm going to go with uh, TKO strikes on the ground, but it could be, one of, again, one of those choose your poison situations where you can lay there and get pounded out or turn your back and get choked. But uh, give me, give me uh, John Castaneda by third round finish. Next up, and at least as the card is currently constructed, the co-main event of UFC Vegas 61 is a welterweight matchup between Randy Brown and Francisco Trinaldo. Brown, the 32-year-old Jamaican, uh, now you know residing in the United States, is 15 and four overall. He's nine and four in the UFC. He is on a three fight win streak. Those being a first round submission of Alex Oliveira, a unanimous decision over Jared Gooden, and most recently a split decision win over Chaos Williams, which took place at UFC 274 back in May. He will look to make it four straight against the ageless Trinaldo, the 44 year old Brazilian, uh, 
28 and 8 overall. He is 17 and 7 uh, in the UFC after joining as the outgoing Jungle Fight lightweight champ and one of the uh, standouts from the very first season of The Ultimate Fighter Brazil. He is on a two fight win streak. Uh, those being a split decision over Dwight Grant and a unanimous decision over Danny Roberts. Uh, those paired with his loss to Muslim Salikov last June make him two and one since deciding to move up to welterweight permanently in the wake of his failure to make the uh, lightweight limit against Jai Herbert back in 2020. So he will look to extend this unlikely final career act and this unlikely welterweight run against uh, Brown. He is not favored to do so. Brown is minus 300. Trinaldo plus 240 uh, on the comeback. There is a time when I would have said Brown minus 300 here was a fool's bet. Like age gap notwithstanding, size gap notwithstanding, these are two fighters who are headed in two opposite directions. Just one of them quickly and one of them slowly. Like, it's unbelievable to me that Francisco Trinaldo is still even a borderline relevant fighter in the UFC in 2022. I mean, Danny Roberts and Dwight Grant, those are not, I mean, they're not contenders, but they're not terrible wins. Losing to Muslim Salikov is not an embarrassment. Like, no. Like, if we wrote out the whole list and just ranked all the welterweights in the UFC right now, Trinaldo comes out somewhere probably around 25 or 30. That's not bad. That means there's like 20 welterweights behind them in, in the order. So for him even to be this relevant at age 44, after all the fights he's been in, I mean, the dude, the, I think I said it off the top here. He looked 44 when he got to the UFC. He looks like that, that face app thing that was all the rage a couple years ago. Like he's like a walking face app because his, 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 his body like looks 20 years younger than his head does. Uh, but he is in physical decline. And some of the elements of his physical decline are a little bit mitigated by moving up to 170. Others are not. He's been at a market size disadvantage to everyone he's fought. I mean, he was a short and stocky lightweight. He's five foot eight. Uh, at at welterweight, he's ridiculously undersized. You know, Dwight Grant and Danny Roberts are big guys. Uh, they towered over him, and he managed to beat them anyway. Randy Brown is going to be <laughs> way bigger than any of those guys. And Randy Brown, I mean, right before my very eyes, he is he's proven me wrong and he's he's changed from one kind of fighter to another because if he asked me back in 2016 2017 all the way up through 2019 he was part of that just pack of action fighters at, at Walter White you know Brown Nico Price uh Vicente Luque uh you know they just kind of hung around that that range Brian Barbarena Alex Morono, guys, that eh, they probably won't ever make a break into the rankings, but they'll pick up a lot of bonuses. All their fights will be fun, you know, and Walter Waite needs those guys. Vicente Luque kind of broke out of that pack. So has so has Brown and Brown has done it by not being the guy that finds weird ways to lose fights anymore. Like the Brown that got stuck in a position we will never again see against Nico yeah. Price and got like, yeah, like that's yeah. not that's not him no. anymore. Uh, all of a sudden, he's become a little more composed. I mean, he's still aggressive, but he's become more composed. He started using his enormous advantages in reach and uh, like, like arm and leg reach. His legs are incredibly long and, and he uses that to his advantage. Uh, his arm reach is incredibly long and he uses that to his advantage. He is a surprisingly good ground fighter for a long gangly guy. Um, you know, I mean, he thrashed Alex Oliveira on the ground, a guy that, yeah, he was in the twilight of his career, but for a long time, he was not an easy out for people on the ground. Oh. Uh, yeah, he's, he's transformed. He's past age 30. He's kind of changed his approach to the game and he is looking like a future contender in still one of the hardest divisions in the UFC to become a contender. Like how many fights you have to string together at welterweight where one loss can just stick you at, at back at the back of the line because that kind of 15 through 25 range is so crowded. He looks to be pulling out of there. You know, he's fought, he's being, he's beating different kinds of fighters in Chaos Williams, Jared Gooden, Alex Oliveira. Uh, for the most part, he's not, he's not even letting them into the fight. He's not having those weird mental lapses. You know, I, what I said about uh, uh, Trevin Giles, you know, ahead of our, our last preview where 
he's the more skilled fighter in almost all of his fights, but he's going to make a huge mistake. Oh, and the question right. is just whether uh, Brown has stopped being that kind of fighter. And because he stopped being that kind of fighter, he's not the kind of fighter who's going to let Trinaldo, he's not going to leave the door open for Trinaldo. And that's n- even in his athletic prime, that was not Trinaldo's game. Trinaldo came into this uh, sport a grinder. You know, he's... He's got surprising power in his hands, but knocking people out with one shot has never really been his thing. He's been a grinder, and I can't imagine a scenario where Trinaldo like nullifies Brown in the clinch for three rounds or takes him down in two out of three rounds and is able to keep him there. Uh, I, I think this is going to be, I mean, it's one of the more lopsided fights on the card on the odds. And I think it's going to look be, be one of the more lopsided looking ones in the cage. I think Brown is going to absolutely piece Trinaldo up on the feet. Uh, I think his jab is just going to be splitting uh, Trinaldo's face open. Trinaldo cuts super easy these days because he is just a pile of scar tissue. Uh, you know, Brown will probably kick Trinaldo's legs, kick his body. I don't think Trinaldo will be able to get Brown down. But I think if Brown wants Trinaldo down, he'll probably be able to. Um, just the question will be like whether he decides to but give me randy brown i'm gonna say he gets the knockout here give me uh brown by by second round knockout and i'm gonna say that the brown is winning things on the feet pretty much consistently from the very beginning Ronaldo's gonna have some failed attempts to bring this thing to the ground he's gonna come up short on some haymakers and brown's just gonna be tagging him up the whole time you know brown by second round tko <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm looking at my notes while you're talking, and, and you're saying so many things that I was what I was going to say. So I'm like, you know what? Just for time, I'm not going to repeat a lot of stuff. I'm just going to just kind of add some points, um, like the jab. I mean, he could just he could just jab the whole the whole fight. Jab, deep kicks, jab, and and easily win. Move, stick and move. Uh, Ronaldo, I really see two avenues of victory: kicking. Randy Brown's legs over and over and over again, like Vicente Lique did, because they're so big. Um, and then the only other thing is him hurting him on the feet. Like, I, I agree with you that Trinaldo knocking out Randy Brown would really be surprised me, but he'd have to, to me, he has to buckle him a couple times mm-hmm. landing. Because he's, you mentioned, he's so jacked up. He's, the power has gone with him a little bit to, to, uh, welterweight. But that's it, man. It, it, this is a this is really a tough stylistic matchup for him. Um, his his output is starting to fade as he's gone down. Not that he was ever a high output guy to begin with. <laughs> uh, Brown has looked better and better. His footwork has become better. He's really started to get in that flow state where he's you can see the confidence growing in him. Um, he's come kind of landing some power. You start seeing him like hurting guys more. I'm with you. I think he's gonna just pick him apart i i don't know if he's going to stop trinaldo because trinaldo is so tough but I, like i could see a high kick like catching him yeah but give me brown just to kind of cruise to it kind of like a whole hum decision when you're done with it you're not gonna be like wow what a performance for Randy brown it's just like i'm better than this guy i'm just gonna work him and maybe even get in the clinch a little bit land some knees inside a couple elbows inside but uh yeah i give me a Randy brown by decision and I mean, whether it's pretty or ugly on that recap, we'll be talking about probably a top 15 ish matchup for him. In his next fight. Yeah, we'll probably match make Ryan Brown if he wins this fight. Yeah. That brings us to the main event of UFC Fight Night 211, a strawweight matchup between Mackenzie Dern and Jan Shaunan. Dern, the 29-year-old Brazilian American, is 12 and 2 overall. She is 7 and 2 in the UFC. She won her last time out. It was a split decision victory over Tisha Torres at UFC 273 back in April. That allowed her to bounce back from a decision loss to Marina Rodriguez in the headliner of UFC Fight Night 194 last October. She will look to make it two straight against uh, Jan, the 33-year-old. Uh, from China is 15 and three with one no contest overall. She is six and two in the UFC. Unfortunately for her, those two losses are her last two fights. Uh, she met Carla Esparza at UFC Fight Night 188 last May and got uh, knocked out in the second round. Came back against Rodriguez at UFC 272 in March of this year and dropped a split decision. Odds do favor Dern pretty substantially. She is minus 225 on most sports books right now. Jan floating out there around uh, plus 175 or plus 180. Uh, Keith, 
one thing I, I certainly didn't think I'd be saying about Mackenzie Dern in 2022. Well, two things I didn't think I'd be saying about her. One, I didn't think I'd be saying she is, you know, on the cusp of a title shot, you know, maybe just one or at the most two more wins away. And definitely not at straw weight because over the the course of the first you know four or five fights of her ufc run after coming over from uh lfa she was a one-dimensional grappler i mean she's one of the greatest female grapplers ever uh absolutely but you know one-dimensional i mean she was a willing striker just not very good at it and you know often had trouble getting the fight to the ground unless she could just physically bully her opponent. Something which ma was made easier by the fact that she had a tendency to blow weight extravagantly. I mean, until we ran into the William Knights of the world, her missing weight by uh, seven pounds against Amanda Bobby Brundage back in 2018 was pretty much the worst weight miss, you know, any of us had seen in years, yeah. at least in proportion to the fighter's body weight. And it's a fight that frankly, if it hadn't been happening in Brazil, it might have been scratched. We've had fights scratched for weight misses not worse than that, you know, since then. You know, we, we've had heavier fighters than that get scratched for missing by seven pounds. It it got passed through over any objections Brundage might have had because it was in Brazil and they wanted to see their woman there go, fight. Yeah. yeah. Since then, we I mean, we've both said this a few times in previewing, pre previewing her fights. I don't know who like loses weight or finds it easier to lose weight after having a kid, or maybe it's just part of the growing up process that goes from being 22 to 27. You know, like, I think that's probably honestly what it is. It's just that she takes her life and takes her career more seriously. Okay. You know, I mean, in BJJ, the weight classes are further apart and looser. And then in her early uh, MMA career, she kind of handed everything. Uh, and the UFC reinforced that by letting her blow weight as badly as she did against Brundage. Since then, I think she's probably taking things a little more seriously. Uh, and she has still kept some of the, I mean, she's not, she's not an explosive athlete, but she's a fluid athlete, physically very, very strong, uh, has gotten better at getting fights to the ground without really developing any new techniques, just no. gotten better at it. Still not a good striker. Like, I mean, she's yeah. still a willing striker. It's the, I mean, it's the Randa Marcos thing, the Jillian Robertson thing. It's not that they won't throw. They're, they'll come forward and throw. They're perfectly willing to. They're just not very good at it. Kind of hittable. Yeah, like slow. Marina Rodriguez. Oh, Marina Rodriguez God. drew a blueprint to beating Mackenzie Dern. It's just that not everybody can follow that. Like, Rodriguez jabbed her up, kicked her, just managed distance beautifully fought a fought a great long fight against uh, a long fighter uh, fight against dern on the face of it that's something that jan could do i mean she is compared to like some other chinese star weights compared to say you know Li zhang who's like a little muscular tank jan is, is is longer and and does you know function well as an outstriker but Jan's problem is she doesn't have the physical horsepower of the other top strawweights. She, sure. I mean, she got bullied by Carla Sparza, and you know she, she lost to Rodriguez. But the way she lost to Rodriguez was different than the way Dern did. Uh, I just, I, I don't think Jan has anything that's going to keep Dern off her. You know, I, she, I don't think she has the footwork or the speed to keep Dern from just kind of charging in, bent at the waist, and like grabbing at her hips. I think Dern actually might actually be able to hit her with some of her like like sloppy hooks. And most importantly, I think Dern will be able to kind of force her to the, the cage where she probably is most effective at getting takedowns. Like I, I think cage takedowns are her best route to get fights to the ground right now. And I see no indication that Jan's gonna be able to stop that. Uh, Jan has not been submitted in the UFC. She's not been submitted at all in over a decade, but I think that changes here. It's a five round fight. Dern, shockingly, while slimming down, has exhibited, if anything, better cardio than she than she did before. Uh, I, I think Dern is able to get this fight to the ground and maybe it doesn't happen immediately beyond as good survivability. She's tough, but, uh, you know, 
I think she probably gets her down in every round if she wants to. And by the third or fourth, Dern will be the fresher fighter. And yeah, give me Dern to get just kind of kind of a bruisery like topside submission. Like, you know, she gets an arm bar from Mount, she gets an arm triangle, something like that, where Yan is just tired, shoulder blades flat on the mat, and you know, you and I as wrestlers know that's not where you want to be in MMA or wrestling. Give me uh Dern by fourth round submission. Yeah, Dern. I wonder, like, when women are pregnant. Like, my my wife obviously was pregnant with our children. And she's she had three kids, and she get the women get these like weird cravings when they're pregnant. Maybe like, maybe like Kenzie Dern like had cravings for like Caesar salads and stuff. Like, this. So, like <laughs> I'm craving celery. Like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, and they, those carrot sticks are just slow, and it just kept going. I, I don't know. I have a craving for water and carrot sticks, and wheat germ or something. Um, yeah, I mean, Kenzie Dern, she's, uh, she's so aggravating because she has this one area where I, I truly believe she could be anybody in the weight class on any night. It's just unlikely. Does that make sense? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't expect her to ever win the title. But if she got matched against the champion, if she got matched against Carlos Esposa, she could easily submit her and release and win the title. And do that with everybody. Um, I mean, we talk about her loss to Marina Rodriguez. Yeah. She almost submitted her in the first round. She she had her where she wanted her in the first round. It's just she couldn't sustain that style. Uh, she's she's a minus athlete. Like She's not a good athlete. She's kind of plotting and everything. But, he, yeah, her, her striking has, has come, come a long way. I mean, it's – it's coming. She's not a threat there, but she's at the point where now you have to. You can't just completely ignore it. And she has some power. I mean, she's. I mean, she's got some build to her. She's got some pop on it. But as you mentioned, she's 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 a wizard on the ground. I mean, she's she's not a strong wrestler. It's like she struggles to get it there. Um, she's not going to drive you your hips or anything. She's going to kind of have the ugliest takedown ever. A lot of times she just gets the clinch and like duck under, slowly take you back that way, like from a standing position or just like pull you to the, to the ground, back knock you, whatever it is. But it's, it's not even Damian Maya. It's like juicy for me good takedowns. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But if she gets you to the ground, she's a absolute threat. And we've ever seen for every second that it's there. She's a what five, I think five time world champion. Uh, she's got, I mean, almost all of her wins have come by submission. Incredible top control, slick, slick back takes, crazy flexibility. She, she's on, she's threats in every position and scrambles on top, on bottom. Um, yeah. Jan, Jan's a high output striker. She's, she's technically sound, she's very fast. Uh, she's got a good jab. She throws power shots down the pipe. I actually think she hits harder than than you give her credit for. Uh, she she has the ability to strike while backing up, which I really like. Um, she has shown shown some offensive wrestling. Like she out wrestled Carolina Kovacevic, but defensively she's had some holes. I mean, you talk about Carlos Spaza, Claudia Gadelia was another one who took her down. Um, and she really struggles to get off the bottom. I mean, Kelly Spars are like ground and pounder into oblivion. So, to me, I'm not sold on McKenzie. I'm definitely not sold on McKenzie's are striking. Um, I'm not sold on her athleticism. I'm not sold on her wrestling. So, I actually think uh, Yan Shanan is a better threat if she could stick and move. Stick, but she has such a speed advantage uh, on the feet. The issue is if she gets taken down one time. That's all Dern needs. Not even like seconds. She could lose every fight, and then just that's all she needs. I think think about a fighter like a Ryan Hall, or or you know who do have these. A uh, Charles Oliveira, another one. They don't need law. Paul fucking Craig. Paul Craig. Yeah, I like think forget about Paul, <laughs> Paul Craig. So that's why it's such a hard time picking against Mackenzie Dern. I think Yon's going to do her best. I think she's going to circle. I think she's going to jab. I think she's going to move. But sometimes you have these uh, these strikers. You see people. Who, I'm sorry, these grapplers. You see people who the strikers are so scared to to engage with them because they're worried about them ducking under their right hand or something like that, grabbing a single, getting to the ground. So sometimes you can see the opposite when they don't even they're not even striking. They're not doing anything. Um, I just I see Kenzie Dern closing distance. I see her somehow tripping her down, maybe even pulling her down, pulling guard, some kind of thing. 
eventually getting the top position, taking her back, working her magic, and getting a submission. I'm going to say she does it right in the very first round. Give me Mackenzie Dern before first round submission. There we go. Uh, two picks for Mackenzie Dern. Quite a bit of difference on what the complexion of the fight from minute to minute will look like, but two pretty comfortable picks for her to have her hand raised at the end of the evening. That is 13 Fights Down. This has been the Shillin and Duffy preview for UFC Fight Night 211, Dern versus Jan. I've been your host, Ben Duffy. He has been Keith Shillin. Uh, if this is your first time watching one of our previews, first of all, thank you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We do our best to provide uh, as in-depth and detailed an analysis of these fights as you will find anywhere in the industry with uh, just the right sprinkle of silliness and uh, historical asides. Uh, please do like, subscribe, comment in the comment section if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, Keith and I both reply. We'd love to hear your takes on these fights. But most importantly, please do join us on the recap. We are live on the SureDog uh, YouTube page, usually about 15 minutes after the main event, where we will be breaking down all of these fights in reverse order of how we just did it now, starting from that headliner, going all the way down to the curtain jerker. We will talk about what was good, what was bad, what was surprising, what was controversial. There's always something. We'll be talking about what's next for some of these fighters, whether they won or lost. And the live chat is wide open during that recap. So we are taking your questions, your comments, and your hot takes live. We have a vibrant and growing community of friends there that we look forward to interacting with every Saturday night. Uh, Keith will tell you, as will I, that it's you know basically uh, the most enjoyable part of our job here at SureDog. So we certainly hope you will join us. Between now and then, thank you once again for watching. Enjoy the rest of your week, and by all means, enjoy the fights.